Welcome to the Arlington School Committee. Today is Thursday, June 9th. Um, do we have any public participation? No. No? Okay. Okay, uh, then we can go right on to the literacy and ELL uh, park presentation. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. Is he here? He's not here. He's not here, but you want to mention what we're going to do. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me just uh, sorry. No, you can sit down. But uh, <laughs> you said to sit down. I just wanted to mention a, a slight change. Uh, Dr. Janger is going to come by for a few minutes to talk about a slight amendment to the calendar, and we're going to sort of take that out of order mm -hmm. as he's available. So when he, uh, after this presentation, but when he comes in, we will um, take him out of there. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Great. Good evening. Mm -hmm. I'm Linda Hansen, and this is Tammy McBride. Nice to see you all. And we are the district literacy, elementary K-5 literacy coaches. And we came to you this evening to um, talk to you a little bit just about what's going on in terms of curriculum in the elementary literacy arena. And also, we had talked a lot last fall about kind of the pros and cons of PARC versus MCAS. And so right after the students took the ELA M um, PARC this year, we surveyed them. And we thought it would be interesting to find out from the students themselves kind of the answer to some of the questions we had. How stressful was it? How different was it from what they experienced before? So we put together a little presentation for you that um, we'll talk about that as well. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and I'm actually going to need my other glasses. <clears throat> So we'll start out with um, the park feedback from the students, and then we'll move on to how we feel like this is all connected to the curriculum. So just as a reminder, one of the elementary schools <coughs> took the computer-based test. That was the Bishop School, and all the other elementary schools took the paper and pencil test. We'll start off with the Bishop results, and then move to the Dallin results, and then talk about some curriculum connections and some reflections from there. So we'll start off with Bishop. So the Bishop students took the assessment on an iPad with a keyboard, and one of the key questions that we all had was, what was this timed nature of the test? How was that going to feel to the students? So the first question we asked them was, did you finish in the amount of time given? And the yellow-ish green, pea green on top there, um, are the students that finished on time. And then the next level is almost finished. And for some of them, it, they finished maybe one of the three days on time, or two of the three, but not all. And then the very bottom there were the students that felt like they really had a lot left after the 90-minute time allotments. The next question we asked was, was this test similar to the kind of work we do in class? Now, we don't want work, schoolwork to feel like tests, so you know, there's a, a variance there. But we wanted to know how similar it felt, particularly the, the essay portion of what they were doing. And on the top there, you see that was very similar. And then that whole big orange section in the middle was kind of similar to what they do. And then at the bottom, the red was, didn't feel very similar to students. So you can see um, in third and fourth grade, there's maybe 10 to 14% that felt it wasn't very similar. But everybody else said that it was kind of or very similar to work, the work they do in class. Then we tried to get at that question in a different way and say, not how similar did it feel, but did you feel prepared for the kind of work that you were expected to do on the test? And the, as curriculum people, this felt um, good to us, that more than half of the kids felt very prepared for the kind of work they were being asked to do. Um, again, then on the bottom, the, the large orange section was kind of prepared, and just the tiny little bit at the bottom uh, were students who reported not feeling very prepared for the kind of work they did. Then we were curious to find out how these students would compare the PARC to the MCAS test. Now, the Bishop students, there were two factors that were different, right? It's a different test, but they were also taking it using technology. So we're not sure how much of that factored into their, their answer here. But um, the smallest percentage felt like the PARC was harder than the MCAS. Um, a very large section in the middle felt that the PARC and MCAS were about the same. And then um, on the bottom, and interestingly in fifth grade, more than half of the kids felt the PARC was easier. And we're not, I'm just kind of curious how much of that had to do with the fact that they were taking it on the iPad. 
how comfortable were you typing your essay? This, this was another big question that parents and teachers had. Um, how was the keyboarding aspect going to feel? And again, if you look, you know, the large majority felt very comfortable typing. The orange section at the bottom there, kind of comfortable. And then the very bottom, not comfortable. So it was interesting that really it was like 99% of the fifth graders felt kind of or very comfortable. About 20% of fourth graders were the least uncomfortable with the typing. And I'm wondering if that was because they were typing more and longer essays, but not feeling as proficient as the fifth graders. In third grade, there was only about 10% of kids that felt um, not as comfortable, but I don't think they typed as much as the fourth graders. And then how did you like taking the test on the iPad as compared to a paper and pencil test? Um, no surprise, the large majority really enjoyed taking it on the iPad. Um, you have a chunk at the top that really didn't have a preference of the, of the vast majority in the middle felt like they'd prefer the iPad or a computer, and then some at the bottom preferred paper and pencil. Again, you have that 20% of fourth graders, so that might be the keyboarding issue again. So overall, the majority of students completed the test in the given time. The majority thought similar or kind of similar to the kind of work they do in school. The majority felt very prepared and a very small percentage not prepared. Um, in terms of comparing the two, the two formats, PARC seemed easier or the same as MCAS. Comfort level typing we just talked about and the majority preferred the iPad. I will say um, we did ask an open-ended question at the bottom too to ask the students what advice they would give the people who wrote the test. And we found, you know, kids say the darndest things. We have lots of interesting results there. And we will put that together for you. We had to do this, ironically, paper and pencil test because all the iPads were taken by the testing situation. And um, students at this grade can't, don't use Google Forms, so we're still tabulating those results. But even though the majority of students did complete the test in the given time, there were um, still quite a few kids who said that the, t the time factor was stressful and you know kids are very compassionate and so even if they themselves finished on time they didn't think it was fair that not everybody finished on time they loved 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 the videos wanted more videos um, and they they said some questions were asked in a confusing way and many many students said that and i have to agree i think some of the questions are kind of um, phrased in a confusing way Many of them didn't like the part A, B questions, you know, the multiple choice, what's the answer, and then how did you find the answer? But they were very insightful about saying things like, they didn't give us enough of the context of where, you know, what gave you the evidence. They said a couple words isn't enough, they should put the whole sentence and things like that. Um, and then the grade three students didn't like the earphones. They said they hurt their ears. So those were just kind of some of the anecdotal things that they said. So to make this a true TBT throwback Thursday, we'll talk a little bit about the good old paper and pencil um, based testing. Um, we looked at the Dallin school students to give us feedback on how they felt with this format of the park test. So similar questions. Um, the first question was, did they finish in the amount of time given? And as you can see, um, the overwhelming majority of the students did finish in the amount given with a smaller percent, almost finished and um, very minimal with a lot, of, um, a lot left. And again, um, looking at whether the test was similar to the kind of work they did in class, um, this is a little different. If you can see, the majority um, felt like it was kind of similar as opposed to very similar. And I know Linda talked a little bit about how necessarily we don't necessarily want classrooms to feel like testing zones, so um, just really interested in, in, in hearing more about that from them. They did touch a little bit upon that in the open response questions as well. And then, um, as far as being prepared for the kind of work that was on the park testing, um, there's a mix between um, the majority of students feeling very prepared and kind of appear, prepared, um, and only grade three had a small percentage that felt not prepared um, at all. And just curious um, to think a little bit about if you notice as the grade levels go on and the complexity of the test items increase, you see that there's less that felt very prepared um, and more that felt kind of prepared. So just thinking about how the tasks increase um, from grade level to grade level. And again, um, we asked students to compare their experience um, with the park and MCAS. And in grade four, um, there's a small percent that felt that park was easier 
and a small percent that felt park was harder with the majority landing in um, park and MCAS being very similar um, and similarly in grade five as well. So, I think you go on. So just um, to summarize the paper and pencil-based testing overall, um, again, as far as the time component, the majority of students were able to finish in the amount of time given. Um, the majority thought the work was somewhat similar um, as to the work they do in class as opposed to very similar. The majority felt very prepared or kind of prepared for this assessment. And um, the majority felt that PARC and MCAS were very similar. And again, just one interesting um, item that Linda and I want to explore and think more about is that the computer-based test takers felt that PARC was easier than the MCAS in higher numbers. So thinking about is that because of the technology piece or really getting at the heart of that from students. So um, obviously at the heart of what we do is all about students. So hearing from them and, and their, their lens with this experience is helping Linda and I to really think more deeply and push our thinking around the implementation of the Common Core Standards in, um, in our literacy units of study um, in classrooms. So we know that the Common Core Standards should prepare students to, to be prepared for this type of assessment um, and for these type of tasks um, and also be engaging. So we're really using this feedback from students and, and using their voices to help us reflect on how are we doing right now in our literacy cur uh, curriculum to address the Common Core Standards and really to give students experiences in their everyday life that prepare them for this test as opposed to having it feel like a separate test prep, that these are really embedded in their reading and writing units of study every day. So what we'd like to do tonight is sort of give you a little bit of a day in the life um, for reading and writing for our, our students and give you a snapshot of the types of experiences that they're being exposed to within our units that both address the Common Core Standards and also prepare them for tasks like this that are also motivating and engaging. So I'm going to begin um, with the writing curriculum. Over the past several years, Arlington has been rolling out and implementing the Lucy Calkins Writing Workshop Units of Study. Um, this is a very robust program that provides students with experiences in all genres of writing, including in opinion, informative, and narrative writing. Our teachers are reporting to us and feeling really energized about these writing units coming alive in their classrooms. Um, they've appreciated the professional development that's happened around these, and particularly teachers that have participated in their lab site experiences. They're really sharing that they feel like they're able to um, have these lessons in their classroom with fidelity, um, with really great results. So students are excited, but teachers are, are as well. Um, a particular focus this year was on the literary essay units under the opinion genre for grades four and five. And in, within those units, students are given the task of analyzing short stories where they kind of grow their own ideas about themes and character motivations. And from those stories, they push their own thinking to create a thesis statement um, from the, the reading that's followed by evidence and reasons from the text to support that thesis. So for example, if they were reading a short story like The Marble Champ, they might notice that Lupe, the main character, shows perseverance. They kind of come up with three reasons how that's shown, and each paragraph then supports with evidence those reasons. And I think the best part about it is at the end, the concluding paragraph is, okay, I've read this, I've shown my thinking through the author's point of view, but what does it mean to me and what does it mean to the world? So the closing might sound something like, sometimes in life you might want to improve or reach a goal and you need to show perseverance just as Lupe did in The Marble Champ. Um, so kind of what new thinking am I growing and how does that matter to the world? Um, and just one side note, as I was traveling through buildings during the park exam, um, classrooms that I've been in, students were pulling me aside saying, Mrs. McBride, we wrote an essay. It was just like literary essay. Um, so hearing from them and their comfort immediately after taking the test, making the curriculum connection was, was really nice to hear. Another particular focus um, in grade four and five is the information writing units. And within these units, students, again, are reading and researching across multiple sources, so primary sources, video clips, articles, and they're gathering information to produce an informative essay. Within those essays are embedded all styles of writing. So for example, Part of the essay might be straight facts and, and teaching on a topic, but also there will include mini stories, so personal narratives of an experience that they've had with this informational topic. And the last piece has some sort of perspective component. So if they were writing an informational essay on the Arctic, they might have um, 
a letter or a postcard from a researcher who's in the Arctic writing home about the conditions that they're experiencing, the things that they're seeing. So even though it's informa an informative piece, it has other styles of writing embedded within. And just before I pass the mic to Linda, one of our goals this summer is to work with um, Denny Conklin, our social studies director, um, and teachers to really focus on taking the social studies content of immigration for fourth grade and revolutionary war for fifth grade um, and really aligning and, and integrating that um, with these writing units of study. So. Great. All right. So then just a few um, thoughts on what we're doing in the reading curriculum. So in third, so we've done some work again in upgrading and adopting new units of study in reading. So I'm just going to briefly show you one from grades three, four, and five. And a lot of the work we're doing is around what are being referred to as SEPAs, the Curriculum Embedded Performance Assessments that come at the end of the units of study that really help kids integrate and synthesize the learning they've done and, as Tammy keeps saying, like grow their own new ideas that they can support. So in third grade, just one quick example um, is something called the home unit, where home is the theme and what makes a home special is what kids are thinking about. They do some close reading for, with several different picture books and then their performance assessment at the end is seeing if they can use the writer's craft elements that they've learned from each of the authors in the unit and write their own piece about what makes their home special, um, kind of borrowing and mimicking some of the writing um, author's craft that they've seen in, and explored in the unit. And then in fourth grade, um, they do a leadership unit where they're studying the concept of leadership and the inquiry question is what makes someone a good leader? So again, they study um, in depth four different picture books about four different leaders, Jackie Robinson, Amelia Earhart, Nelson Mandela, and a fictional um, leader, Wesley. And then at the end, they come back together and they synthesize their thinking across um, these four texts in a fairly elaborate kind of complex way there, identifying a leader, describing the person's accomplishments and why they're important. But then they have to go beyond that and say, name and explain, so two values that make this person a good leader. And then again, building on top of that, consider which other person that we studied would be the most respected by the leader you're writing about. So something they've, they haven't had direct experience with, this is where they build on the knowledge um, and the things that they've studied. And then in the end, write a newspaper article about that. And finally, in fifth grade, um, a current event unit, um, clean water. So they read an article, they watch a video clip um, about struggling to get clean water in Ethiopia, and then they go through a unit of study, and they, at the end, they look at insights that they gain from both the article and the video, pick three, um, name several struggles about clean water, identify one um, solution, and then talk about what you would need to do to kind of make that happen. So one of the things um, that we did, we've heard a little bit about students' perspective and curriculum perspective, but at the, the last professional development for fifth grade teachers, they had a choice of this clean water unit or another unit on slavery, and we asked teachers to just talk about the pros and cons from their experience teaching it for the first time. So I just wanted to read a few of the pros that teachers felt um, out of this unit on clean water. They felt like it was um, great because it connected to the science unit of study, Kids had a lot of background knowledge about water. They could use diverse media and video clips, knowledge of facts um, versus shouting out opinions, open students' eyes to the world around them, ability to connect to current events like the Michigan water crisis. They liked the letters to the editor component, um, ability to connect the subject matter with opinion writing. The topic was pertinent and the students were immediately engaged. Um, cyclical pattern of the lessons between the books. So we're looking for you know, to ensure that these units that we're developing really are engaging and motivating for students and, and making sure that that's the case. So just to sum it all up, um, this is what we've been aiming to do, provide students with the experiences they need to grow their skills in the areas of close reading, academic discourse, analyzing text, synthesizing ideas from multiple sources, and writing with evidence. And our overall goal is really for students to develop their own thinking and insights and to communicate their ideas effectively within their communities. 
And so Linda and I are really passionate to continue to refine this work and identify ways to better support teachers as well with this high level of expectation. And again, at the heart of it is really focusing on implementing these Common Core standards in a way that are motivating and socially engaging with students. Um, all of what we've talked about tonight with reading and writing, um, we recently went to see Dr. Nancy Fry with Dr. Chesson and she talked about how reading and writing floats on a sea of talk. So really, these units are also very social where students are engaging in conversation um, that then supports them sharing their own thinking. So we're excited. Yeah. And maybe one final, final comment, and then we'll stop and see if there are any questions. But um, there was an article in the Globe recently um, about standardized testing. And one of the sayings that they pulled out, I thought was very pertinent to the thinking that we're doing around the new um, testing that's coming along and rethinking the role of standardized testing. And it's, I guess it's an economist saying, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. And I feel like we, this, this whole harmless um, kind of little period of time we have here, it was really so nice to see. And you could just feel the much more relaxed nature of the teachers and the students. And it just kind of feels like it's really going to be important to see how we can continue to carry that on even after this whole harmless period ends. So. I think um, you know, our work is really to make sure that our teaching is doing what we need it to do and the testing can just be that. It's just like a dipstick, a, a moment in time, and then we kind of move on. So that's our presentation for you this evening. I have a clarificatory question before we move on. Um, the uh, student surveys that you did, was it just for the ELA? portion of the park, it wasn't for the math portion as well. Right, because okay. we felt like we really wanted to focus on just what was different and right. you know, specific to the ELA. Okay, part. great, yep. thanks. Questions, comments, Mr. Hainer. The, uh, talking about uh, preparing the students in reading and stuff like that, is part of the emphasis also on content reading, social studies, math, and I mean, social studies and uh, science have a tremendous uh, concentration of vocabulary where it's intense right at the beginning unlike uh, novels and, uh, and other forms of literature and stuff. So could you briefly comment on that? So absolutely, and I think a lot of reading comprehension we're learning comes from really just background knowledge. And so we, uh, I think where we are right now is also just seeing that we need to make way in the curriculum for a lot more social studies and science work. And so we are looking to, as Tammy mentioned, partner with social studies this summer to to really start working on integrated units of study with social studies and ELA. And the next phase would be looking at science too. As FOSS is rolling out, it's still pretty new for the teachers and brand new to us. But our, we intend to work with them to really look at those units of study and say, how can we bring this literacy, reading comprehension, writing lens to those content units? And I assume that, and first off, I should have, your presentation was fantastic, and I apologize for not mentioning that at the beginning. Uh, the, the content books have glossaries in the back for the most part. Uh, hopefully they've changed. I don't remember very many glossaries in math books. Uh, other than there are nowadays. Great, it's good to hear. <laughs> it's really good to hear because I mean, I remember telling the kids when you see sometimes the word in science and social studies would be highlighted, and that was a clue to go back to the glossary. We didn't have them in the math books back then, so I'm glad to hear that. Thank you, Mr. Sleeman. Uh, you know, with the new electronic technology, you don't need the glossary; you just touch the word. Uh, as long as you have as long as you have the um, glossary built in the, the glossary built in or the software attached to that um, so this, this is great I, I love the data I, when I opened up the um, uh, the presentation I said, wow this is fascinating uh, do you know and I guess it, it's not your role to answer this question because you're elementary folks so I'm going to throw it through the chair <coughs> to whoever might want to answer it from the administration do we have similar responses from middle school ELA? Uh, we have not yet um, finished uh, 
getting the surveys done from middle school. Mm -hmm. um, their testing cycle was much longer because they had the science as well. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, that although they did a phenomenal job mm -hmm. testing um, 450 or 430 students mm -hmm. at a time, um, was so those people have just taken a breath and then, and then we'll get similar data from well, them. Well, yeah, yeah, it was, it's more complicated because you have to extend the <coughs> out on, on, the, on the electronic mm -hmm. where the paper and pencil can be done in one sitting. So, but I, I, I was fascinated by the way that they were responding relative to how prepared they were and, and how comfortable they were between the two. Uh, we'll, be getting this, we'll be asking the same questions. Yeah, from middle school. I, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. It was so informative. I'm glad you did this. Um, reading and writing floats on a sea of talk. That's a great line. <laughs> she was phenomenal. And I, and I also think that that also ties in, what, what you heard them talk about a lot was the integration of the reading and writing. Uh -huh. um, you know, I, if I can remember back that far, when I was in elementary school, reading was a separate topic for writing. They never were really integrated. And Lucy Calkins really talks about um, that integration and when kids write then you say well why would an author do that when they read so how would you how would that connect to what you're doing in writing but also the talking is critically important for students that are behind the benchmark mm -hmm. because if you think about a third grade student that's behind the benchmark how are they going to have a discussion mm -hmm. with closed text and what they do is they used mentor text mm -hmm. and uh, read aloud text mm -hmm. where the so they the conversation is mo is what is similar to what mm -hmm. kids, other kids would be doing in close reading. So it starts to build those skills, mm -hmm. even if their reading skills are behind. Excellent. Thank you. For this. this is great. Thank you. Can I actually add one? So we did survey the teachers as well, um, and we'll pull those together for you maybe for the fall. Um, but we thought it, was inter it would be interesting to have the teacher perspective as well uh, as to what they thought. Great. How, what they thought. Great. Right. Yes. Dr. Alice Nabby. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was fascinating. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing the comments from the students. Mm -hmm. I, I think that sounds really interesting. Yeah. And then the other thing is I hope that we can come back once we actually have the results from PARC and correlate, for example, how many questions were left unanswered to see how many students actually didn't finish. Um, I mean, it's assuming that you can make that that connection um, because I'm <coughs> the time nature of the park test is something that has concerned me since they began talking about it and um, I just like to have a sense of that I'm, I feel like the students do it doesn't seem fair for someone not to finish because they run out of time so the Department of Education is holding kind of sneak previews of MCAS 2.0 at, at the end of, of June and part, one of the questions they had asked was, do you think um, the new test should be timed, generously timed or untimed? So I'll be curious to see what, the, it's an indication of what direction they're going in, not you know, kind of exact formats, but I'll be curious to see myself where they're going with that. Uh, yes, Just to comment, yeah. this is the, yeah. to answer Dr. Allison Anthony's question, I don't think the park results are going to be granular enough that you're going to be able to pick out uh, anything based on the uh, unanswered questions. Um, unfortunately, there are summary results being presented through the consortium and the depth of the data that, 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 that I've seen at least this year from park districts hasn't been quite as deep as it is. For, for MCAS, so uh, that's another reason why I'm happy to see us moving to 2.0 next year. Uh, and on the electronic testing, you, you really have a different question because everybody's not getting the same question. It's, it's more iterative, so uh, you can't tell that somebody finished question 35 and somebody didn't. Uh, it's just that this iterative assessment runs out of time and then stops playing. Another, since we're on the time, I'll say one more thing. Some of the student, individual students' responses were they actually liked the time factor of it because then you were just done and you could just move on with your day. And they, they, some of them felt like it had gone on a long time before, yeah. and this way they could just move on. Mm -hmm. so. uh, what? Yeah. Yes, Dr. Reddy. Yeah. I also want to say thank you. It was a great presentation, and it's good to, to see how our students are feeling about this as we go into this new era of uh, testing. But my comment is actually really to, um, to 
a different role that Linda plays in our district. And she, when she walks from that table over to that table, she's <laughs> going to move over as a AEA president. And this is going to be her last meeting uh, in that role. And um, I just want to acknowledge um, her leadership these last uh, years. She's been a terrific partner and collaborator as we've worked through a lot of problems. Her leadership has been truly outstanding. And I think tonight you saw uh, actually uh, some glimmers of the kinds of analysis that she does that's, uh, that's affected. When we looked at GIC, we looked at mm -hmm. salary scales. I mean, she has a, an enormous talent in being able to aggregate data in very, um, very clear and meaningful ways. But you know that's only one skill. Her real skill is that she's just been a tremendous leader and um, uh, has served uh, both the district and her membership well. And I, and I do want to thank her publicly and uh, acknowledge that as she's sort of moving into this next phase. Mm -hmm. But w the good news is we're going to get more of her as literacy. As you can <laughs> see, this <Yeah>. is good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Dr. Bodhi. I, I mean, I think it really has been a, a very challenging but also very gratifying um, four <coughs> years as president. And I do feel like we've formed a lot of great partnerships. And I can just look across the committee, too, and think about work on the foundation budget, work on the charter cap, work on the budgets and schools, you know, just like right down the road, work on the community surveys. And, and I do feel like, you know, with many of the members of the committee, we've, we've also been able to collaborate and work um, very well together, and I think ultimately that's how we in Arlington have tried to make our best, uh, do the best with the kind of mm -hmm. policies, we, education policies we've been getting from the state and federal government, and really try and always do it in a way that works best for the students and, and faculty in Arlington. So I look forward to my continued work in the district, and thank you for those kind words. Uh, so now we're going to take out of order. Um, th thank you very much. It was really. Um, if we can ask Dr. Janger to come up, and what we should do is pull up the calendar. We're not going to vote on it now, but just sort of yeah, look at it because there's a small addition. Uh, Dr. Janger is going to explain a little bit of his rationale for this small change. <laughs> But actually, we hope to invite him back in the fall to give us a full-fledged sort of vision of how conferences might be different next year. So. First, can I just publicly thank Linda, myself? Mm -hmm. Pleasure. Um, so, do you want me to just talk? Uh, yes. Actually, tell us what the change is first, okay. and, then, and then you can talk about the rest. Um, so, as is often the case, education is. Um, is easy compared to managing time and space. Um, and so this is a schedule issue, and the schedule issue has to do with parent-teacher conferences. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, and I don't have the dates in front of me, I sent them to you. Um, but what we're asking in the simple version is to add um, one more early release day for parent-teacher conference time. Um, actually, let me read it in a more detailed way. Um, so I can just read it here. I think, is it the November 15th date, is that right? This is the November 15th right. and the November 29th. November 15th and November 29th would be. The calendar before, I can't remember. No, November. I'm sorry. We had October dates. Oh, we had October okay. We were do, doing it. last year. So, but, go ahead, got it. last okay. year we had October dates. Um, the year before that we had November and December dates. Um, uh, based on overwhelming response in surveys, we'd like to move back to November dates. Um, we would like to have, and I believe the dates are November 15th for an early release, November 29th. 20th for the evening, correct? Right. <laughs> 17, it, Dr. Janger, is the evening. So okay, November 17th the for the evening. Yes. Sorry. There was some back and forth to try to keep it off of school committee dates. Yes, um, and then November 29th for the early release. School committee date. Um, and we would also like to add um, a spring or a spring semester, so it would be in February, conference date for evening conferences. Mm -hmm. And what was the date for that? Well, it was an open house. It's, well, it's going to be open, open house. Open house. I'm sorry, right, for we open houses. We didn't put that on the calendar because it was going to be sort of a slash open house conference night. Okay. Sorry, I'm being horribly inarticulate. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the dates. 
the rationale for it goes like this. Um, we've surveyed the parents every year and its teachers <coughs> for the last three years on parent-teacher conferences. Um, and we come back with sort of a mixed review. The way it works right now, we have five-minute conferences for um, one early release and two evenings. Mm -hmm. That produces about 72 five-minute slots. Um, the problem is that a teacher who is teaching a full load, who are many of the teachers who the um, people most want to see, is teaching 100 to 130 students. So every year at 10 o'clock, we open the uh, registration, and it's like trying to get tickets to name your favorite band. Um, and by about 1 o'clock, I'm getting angry emails from people mm -hmm. that afternoon that they can't get in. The second thing is that the teachers um, and the parents have really different senses of the purposes of student-teacher conferences. So when we surveyed them, from the teacher's perspective, they would like to use conferences as a time to talk to those parents who they need to have some conversation with. There are, for students who are seriously struggling, other venues. You have guidance meetings, team meetings. But there's a large group of students where the teachers would like to have a constructive conversation with the parents. Um, and five minutes is not enough for that. They would like that, to be, that time to be focused more on parents who want to really see them about something that they need to talk to them about or feel is important, and teachers to be able to talk to parents who they'd like to have a conversation with that they feel is important, and they'd like there to be 10 minutes. Parents, when we had the conversation in the school council and when you read the survey, um, many of them had a very different perspective on the purpose and reason for parent-teacher conferences. As many of them said, I thought good parents went to conferences. Um, and thinking that good parents went to conferences, many felt obligated to go, and many valued the opportunity to have a quick face-to-face -face conversation and get to know. That's why I always went. I was like not worried about my kids, but I wanted to just meet the teacher and have a conversation with them. Didn't have to be very long. The problem with that is that to meet both of those needs would require hours and hours either pulled out of instructional time or teachers to come back in the evening. So we had a conversation in which, as the parents put it, um, they really wanted a little bit of a paradigm shift. And the idea was that we would focus on having parent-teacher conferences be 10 minutes long. Um, we would ask teachers to identify some parents they thought were appropriate to talk to and reach out to them. And we would ask parents who felt that they had a reason to talk to the teachers um, to make those appointments. And we would ask them on an honor code, on their honor, to try not to schedule conferences with more than two teachers. But we'll let people schedule what they think is appropriate because I think that's fair. Given that, if you have only six hours of conferences, um, I'm sorry, then we wanted to take one of the evening conference dates and switch that to the spring. So the idea was to create two different venues, one for parents, I'm not doing this very well, one for parents to get to know the teachers. So the idea is if you just want to meet the teachers and get to know the teachers, you would come to open house in the fall. You would come to a reception that would be held during faculty meeting time in December. And you would come to an open house at the beginning of the second semester. That also solves the problem of second semester classes where the parents never get to meet or hear from the teacher. So if you're a parent who just wants to know what's going on in the school, you now have three times to check in and have some face time with your teachers but you're not taking up those little five-minute slots. In order to deal with that, then we now only have one evening time and one early release time. And that's not enough, particularly with 10-minute slots. So we wanted to add one more early release time. So with the two early releases and the late night time, you'd have six hours of conferences. And I have to do the math in my head every time, but it's 36 slots. If you felt, and this is really up to the school committee, I think, that the slots were particularly important, I would encourage you to make it a noon release, which would give us an additional 12 slots. So instead of 30, 72 five-minute slots, we will have 36 or 48 10-minute slots. But the 10-minute slots will be focused on students who, where there's a reason to have a conversation. So that's basically the proposal. So actually on this calendar, um, the noon is, put at noon. we put them at noon. That's so, what you want. Is that yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. So then it's 48 days, minutes. That's, that's what it right. is on here. Um, yeah, let's, questions and comments, Mr. Hainer. I just, this is directed to the superintendent. I assume we're still within the required hours of class. Thank you. 
It's just my only concern. My question is on the November 17th date. If, if you were working to avoid the school committee meeting night, how come we landed on a school committee night? Um, we talked about that, um, that issue. Because this is going to be much more limited conferencing and longer ones, we thought that the parking wouldn't be that challenging. But, and there's a strong preference of teachers doing conferences on Thursday nights, and there's not much room in, in November to do anything else. And the reason why there's a strong preference by teachers for that, as you can imagine, is yeah. why we're doing it on Thursday nights too. You, you can, you know, you're up late, and you, then you come in for one more day. Well, well you're doing. Well, also, can I just go through the schedule for a second? The end of the first term is the 10th. That's a mm -hmm. Thursday. The next day is Veterans Day. Mm -hmm. The 15th was the early release. We don't have con evening events on Wednesday because the teachers have meetings till four and can't go home and come back. So. Um, we put early release days on Tuesday because that's the pattern which we've agreed to in the district. And the teachers were adamant that the experiment we had this year in having um, afternoon conferences and evening conferences on the same day was exhausting and they couldn't do it. So the problem then is you have the Thursday, the 17th, and that's the only Thursday left in the month of November. Well, you've got December 1st, which is two Good. days after your... Uh, your, your uh, Early release, and if the if the school committee felt strongly about that, I think we could work with that. I mean, the, the problem really is for us uh, that I mean, we, we sometimes deal with controversial issues, and uh, people want to come visit us, and we need to come in here uh, often on a tight schedule and, and find parking and, and get up here. And you've got the Arlington Community Education in the building on Thursday nights as well, which brings a crowd. Uh, so the one thing the committee did was specifically ask the high school avoid scheduling events on Thursday nights. Right, and we had that conversation. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I'm a little frustrated here in that uh, we, we've made this request on several years and we come up with concerts and uh, college nights and performances and all sorts of stuff happening on Thursday nights. Uh, creating a crowded situation in this building and a, a difficulty for everybody trying to attend. So I know Dr. Allison, but I'll just express what, what I um, expressed to Dr. Jenger, and this is just my opinion, um, that there's slightly a difference between conferences that only some parents were coming to mm -hmm. and an event where all parents were expected to attend, and what I felt, feel really strongly that we should make sure that is not on school community nights mm -hmm. are things like the, um, what are they called? The college fair? Or no, the, um, we the moved curriculum, the the open curriculum house. nights. Open house. The open houses mm -hmm. where every parent is expected to attend, whereas this a parent could potentially you know, avoid the conflict. That, that's, just, that's my opinion that I express, but uh, people could have different but, but, you know, let, let me Let okay. me just yeah, say back is that if you've got a percentage of the high school parents and the entire faculty and uh, us and community education, yep. we're overtaxing our facility. Oh, for parking, for sure. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. I was just going to say exactly what you said. Okay. So. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. I should let you speak first. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, parking is definitely an issue. Um, mm -hmm. Well, would December 1st work? We can move to December 1st. I mean, that's the, the thing, you know, if the school committee feels strongly, I think we should move it to December 1st. The preference of teachers and parents was to have it in November. But it's two weeks. I'm fine with that. Do we want, want to get other people's opinion, Mr. Cardin? You... Yeah, I mean, I, I don't feel strongly about it. Mm -hmm. I, I think you know, if, it, if it's that much of a problem, then we can move our meeting. I mean, if, if the teachers feel strongly that it should be in November, then I would defer to the teachers. Yeah, actually, we actually did talk about um, potentially every once in a while moving our meetings. Uh, yes, Mr. Kittman. Yeah, I agree with Mr. Cardin. I think maybe we can move our meeting if this is the only date that works and. The teachers feel this is the time in the calendar, this is the time in the school year to do it. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think we should spend too much time on this. I think there's two options: either we do December first, or we move yeah. our meeting. Right, I think we should. I, I agree with Mr. Uh, Schluckman. November and December are extremely tight for us because of the MASC conference, Thanksgiving holiday, and the budget comes on, and all the meetings that we have with the different people. But again, I defer. If Dr. Jenga feels that it's workable 
if he didn't think it was workable, I would be supporting the other the other way. But if he thinks December first is workable. Uh, I support that. I mean, so let me just read from the surveys. Um, and the parents, um, fifty-five percent of folks wanted it in November, um, and among the teachers, fifty-six percent wanted it in November. The number drops to eleven percent for both, or eleven percent for the parents, and um, six percent for the teachers, nine percent for the teachers. So there is a strong preference now. We all think in big targets, and that's a two-week difference. Right. So, you know, I will really defer. I mean, it's 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 really up to you guys. It sounds like we have I mean, one of the things I would say just about the schedule in general, mm -hmm. Mr. Schlickman, is that, um, you know, when we sit down in March um, in the high school and mm -hmm. map out all of the schedule events we can, mm -hmm. there's sort of an impossible, you know, when you go through, just as I said, there's one Thursday in November when, if you're going to do it on a Thursday, you can have it. And we have that similar problem that pushes things to a limited number of times. Um, and then we end up with, you know, every year, multiple other groups. Sometimes they consult with us. Sometimes they don't, um, having things on other dates. And so we end up with concerts at Audison and other things. And it's just a frustration for all of us. And th there's many nights when I have big events here at the high school and I show up, and there's 100 people parked here for an event that we were not well aware of. So it's, I know it's something Dr. Bodie is working on. Um, but having tried to do this in other districts, it's a moving target in a community that is as active and in a facility that's as active as this. Mr. Kevin. My, own, my preference would be that we, we have a conversation to see if we can move the meeting that week. I, I don't know, I mean, I haven't thought about it, but just to Dr. do a little poll oh, sorry, offline. Sorry. I'm looking at the calendar and I'm not in favor of us moving that meeting because we would then meet December 1st, 8th, and 15th. And that seems like. Oh, I think the no, question was moving to Tuesday. We talked Tuesday about that. Tuesday or Wednesday. Yeah, Tuesday. Uh, doing okay. that occasionally. So I, I would say, sure. I would yeah. say, yes, yeah, so I'm suggesting Chris, Tuesday or Wednesday of that okay. week. If we, if we gotcha. feel that that's what the committee wants. I, okay. okay. We don't have to decide. Mm -hmm. okay. It sounds like that's a sense of the committee um, that you should keep, keep it. I'm, that's why I'm reading this. Mm -hmm. um, and we will decide what to do on our end in terms of okay. whether we have our meeting there. Now you um, should note that he's already moved the open house. It was a Thursday, but we moved it. Yes, great. So it was a Wednesday? Or was it a so I believe we moved it to Tuesday. It was the 20th? Tuesday. Okay. Which it was is a Tuesday. Tuesday the, the 20th. The 20th. Okay, so September. No, September. <clears throat> We're seven people. We could, I, mean, I think we should take a look at other dates that week. That's it. Tuesday night or Wednesday night, the school committee can meet. Okay. Is there a way? that you could for that event I, I don't know how bad the parking really is for open house uh, for conferences mm -hmm. but is there a way that we could simply rope out for example the superintendent's end of the parking um, and make that for school committee meeting it may be on the honor system but um, if you know people are coming or if there's some set of people coming well we'll, mm -hmm. we'll ask Dr. To, to explore okay. that option but thanks thanks for that suggestion Right. Okay. Um, yes, Mr. Hayden. The big trick is not have any hot button items that night. <laughs> I don't know that we can control. No, that. I'm being I'm being facetious. <laughs> okay. So I mean, we also. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Starks. I think we also have to remember it's not just about parking. It's yes. about the fact that Understood. many of us need to take part in these. Yeah. At yeah. some that, point, that, you know, right. I mean, you will our have two kids. other times. Yeah. That's that's right. Right. Why right. to avoid that? So other right. Things. Okay, um, there is some chance that we'll bring you back in the fall. I'll, I'll get, get a sense of whether we feel any, uh, Mr. Dr. Um, Alice Nappy. I just, I wanted to speak to what I think he was really presenting the picture, here. Right. Yeah, the bigger thing, which awesome. is this idea of the change of the conferences. And I think it's fabulous. Mm -hmm. um, I was reading through, so I had a, I have a high schooler for my first year. I was one of the people who did not know about the 10 o'clock opening. I didn't send you any angry emails. I thought it was my fault. Well, the system um, also crashes at 10.30 every time. Okay. Well, I was a couple days later, so there was nothing open for many of the teachers. I was able to see some of them and then sign up on the later schedule, but there were teachers that I wasn't able to talk to at all. Um, I really like the idea of having these open houses. I would suggest for the ones where it's a meet and greet, have name tags for everybody because I'll make it easy. If you're doing brief, um, brief 
meets and greets, it's easier if you can actually see the name and, and put it to a face. Um, but I think that'll be really a nice way of getting to know mm -hmm. more about the classes without having to take up the individual teacher's time. So our plan is following this meeting that you approved the, the basic pattern to send out the description with a letter explaining it to parents to get some feedback um, and then to try to tweak the system going forward. Um, so we'll roll that out a couple times between now and the fall. And just, is that, is that the letter that we have? There's another letter as well. I There's believe, another right? letter okay, that's Okay, so longer. we will get that later on to yep. be able to, yeah, that'd be great. Um, I have to say that I'm one of those parents who thought I had to meet with all my teachers. I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to, so <laughs> I feel bad about that. <laughs> Well, it's funny, there's um, many things we tell parents to do sort of by reflex. Yeah. And I don't know if folks read, but there was a recent large study that looked at all of the research on parent involvement. And many of the things that we do, um, that we think we're supposed to do, not only do they not have a correlation at the high school <laughs> level with better outcomes, some of them have negative correlations with outcomes. Um, the things that are most important are supporting education at home, or talking to your students about the work they're doing, about making sure that they have a regular time to sit down at dinner and to study. Um, those are much more important than sort of being in school or reading power school, um, many of those things which we put a lot of energy into. So hopefully we can educate everybody on that as well. Great. Thanks. Thank Dr. Allison, I'm sorry. I, no, okay, great. Thank you very much for coming. Thank Thanks. you for your time. Thanks. Okay, so we are at the district goals and we are just on time. Okay, Dr. Bodie, do you want to? Yes, thank you. Let me pull this back up. Um, at our last meeting, there were a number of suggestions, um, the, and then the district goals, quite appropriately, were referred to Curriculum and Instruction Accountability Subcommittee, mm -hmm. and we met. Um, and actually, actually, maybe Mr. Schlickman should speak to that. And there were some suggestions made. Um, the subcommittee of the superintendent's uh, committee on diversity came mm -hmm. and, and talked about um, you know, their um, advocacy for cultural competency mm -hmm. being very mm -hmm. much more explicit in the district goals. So there had been um, a couple of changes and um, we've had so many renditions of this, I'll have mm -hmm. to see where we are on this, but in the, under the first goal there was, I think this one you're already aware of, that we had added cultural proficiency skills <coughs> and diverse, so cult, we had social, emotional, and cultural proficiency skills <coughs> needed for college and career readiness and to be com contributing members of a, this is where I put the word diverse, mm -hmm. democratic society. Um, so the major change in goal two was to focus on the professional developments for administrators next year with next year being a planning year for uh, professional development for teachers the following year. The other change that I, I think you were already aware of is moving the addition, the, um, into goal two, the goal about having the diversity of the Arlington Public School staff next year um, have the diversity increase in the baseline of this this year we're, we're in right now. So let me read the goal because I don't think I said that very well. Increase the diversity of the Arlington Public School staff over the 2015-16 staffing levels to better reflect the diversity of our students. Mm -hmm. So that had been in a different place, but it makes more sense to have it here. So everything is pretty much the same until you get to goal three. And um, we did include in goal three, four, involving all stakeholders in the process. A lot of discussion about that. And then one of the other points of discussion is that, you know, we have come to value the outreach to the community in a whole variety of ways, whether the surveys or forums or coffees, or whatever they might be, is to acknowledge that and, and <coughs> recognize it in adding some other language in 4.3, which is continue to engage parents and stakeholders as the district addresses enrollment and facility needs. Mm -hmm. so, so it'll have, a, 
it will vary from having a small committee at Thompson. There's a lot of variety to this, but it's it's acknowledging the work we've been doing and the work we will continue to do as part of these processes. So those are the uh, of the changes. I don't know. Mm -hmm. did, uh, did, did I pretty much? Yeah, that pretty much uh, states it. I think that <coughs> one of the, uh, it, you know, it, it was. The changes are minor in the document, but are substantive in the conversation that we were able to have. Because folks understood what we were already doing and what we're trying to do. And so by highlighting a couple of things, particularly around the cultural competency, we're, we're going to do what we were going to do, but it's highlighting it and, and, and stressing the importance of this work. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the process of going through this in subcommittee was a very valuable one, and I'm, I know that the uh, superintendent subcommittee on diversity of the, uh, it, you know, it's just too long. I can't. <laughs> Cultural competency, Cultural competency <laughs> subcommittee of the diversity <laughs> task force. <laughs> Um, Easy for you to say. Yeah. <laughs> Not really. Uh, but, but, it, but it was really wonderful to have them there to talk about this, and we all came to consensus. Tweak the language a little. Uh, we'll have a, a website up. Uh, we talked about this last week in the, in the, the subcommittee report. Uh, it was a great process, and I'm very appreciative of the folks who participated with us. Dr. Allison Appy. Um, so. I was unable to join you when you were discussing this. Um, the question I had when I was reading through all of these are, how will we in the public know whether the goal was achieved and when will we have that? And I'm thinking especially of, Dr. Seuss has talked about going and trying, and Dr. Bodhi trying to set up the year long agenda and that, you know, these metrics or measure whatever the things are whether they're reports or, or something are what you slot into that agenda and <coughs> right now reading these i don't really have a good sense and so i was hoping to find out at some point when mm -hmm. we're going to find out mm -hmm. what those are and mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. you know both what and when we can expect it dr Brady, can you speak to um, we can. yeah i, I think uh, in subcommittee we discussed this in that in, you have to have the goals first before you develop the uh, measurable outcomes in, in the timelines. And so that uh, the superintendent is going to be working with her administrative staff over the summer to develop that full matrix and present it uh, in, November, in September. Right. So that, that's the next logical step. Right. So we've already carved out the time for it. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Wright, do you think we would get it at the first meeting in September or will, is that too early? No, I don't think okay. it's too early at all. In fact, we're starting to work on it mm -hmm. this June mm -hmm. in the school. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mr. Taylor. So I think to clarify, what, we're, what we want to have in the, in the uh, chart is a column that says, you know, output for school committee review. Right. Or, yeah. you know, item for school committee review or documentation mm -hmm. for school mm -hmm. committee review. So the one column in the chart. Yeah. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Do yeah. we want to, um, it to go to the full committee first, or do we want to go to the subcommittee first? Or oh, I don't know. I think <clears throat> because he's going to do it over the summer. I just trust. Just go to the full committee. I, th I, okay. yeah, I think I trust Kathy okay. to just get it done. Okay. You don't want to meet over the summer? I mean, if, if <laughs> Jeff will be happy. To if meet Paul wants the committee to meet the CIA committee, I will I doodle it and I'll go. <laughs> I'm around. <laughs> you only need two. So actually, I have a comment, which is. Um, to say, uh, this is one of my passions, the, the stakeholder engagement, and that um, stakeholders are uh, a variety of people. They're, they're parents, but they're also, very importantly, uh, teachers and administrators mm -hmm. and community members. And I think that we've done a really good job this year of engaging all mm -hmm. those people um, with respect to the decisions that we had to make. And I know that we have a lot of changes and a lot of decisions coming up in the coming years, and that I'm looking forward to seeing Sort of similar types of processes where we really do, you know, ask teachers what they think, ask, you know, obviously administrators, but and and, and uh, community members that might be affected by it that might not be parents or maybe parents or you know really sort of reach out to all the stakeholders as we go forward. Um, so, are we ready to vote yes. on this? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, Mr. Hainer. Move to uh, accept the district goals for 2016-2017 as presented. Second. Okay. 
A uh, motion made by Mr. Hainer, seconded by Mr. Schlickman. All those in favor? Aye. And aye, too. It's a unanimous vote. Great, thank you. <clears throat> um, okay, so we just have a couple of minute discussion uh, about the uh, buffer zone expansion readjustment process. And I wanted to bring this to the committee uh, to get your thoughts about um, how we should set this up. And my gut feeling is that this is not as dramatic of a process as it was a few years ago when we did a really you know, redistricting and when the assumptions about whether people would be grandfathered or not grandfathered were up at, were in play. <coughs> um, but we have a couple possibilities open to us of how we can handle this and I just wanted to, to get your ideas. Yes, Mr. Hainer. I, just a question. Could you remind me again why we're, we're doing, doing this? I know, I know it was brought up uh, during the school enrollment task force, uh, an issue about what it would take to, to do redistricting and stuff. My memory is that part of the component of the redistricting we did, the superintendent had the, uh, we designated the superintendent's ability to cross lines and stuff when it was appropriate and things of that nature. So I, I guess what I'm asking is, why are we doing this? Right. Okay, so that's, so uh, Mr. Slickman. Yeah, it's minor unless your house is in the uh, right, right. being moved into a buffer zone. Uh, I would, if this is something that we need, think we need to do, uh, and I don't know if it is. Um, I'm lacking the data. Dr. Reddick, I'll, let, I'll let the superintendent yeah. say that. But if if it's necessary to tweak it or make some minor adjustments. And it may very well be that I would refer to community relations subcommittee, which is the process we did the last time we did it. Okay. I actually wasn't sure what we did last time. Dr. Reddy, do you want to speak to the need? Well, if there's one. I think it might be better to, to to wait on this discussion till the fall. I can tell you what my experience has been so far mm -hmm. um, as we've been going through the enrollment. I'm not sure at least at least at this point in time, this, this particular um, registration process, whether it would have made much difference to have wider buffer zones. Mm -hmm. There has been some movement between uh, different buffer zones, but I think the where this began was thinking about the Hardy yeah. Thompson. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the situation there Condition. is that they're both growing. Mm -hmm. We'll talk a little bit on enrollment numbers as well. They're both probably now having kindergartens as a total around 90. Mm -hmm. There's no movement there. But the, some of the thought was, well, maybe some students could go to Bishop. But that's not going to work either mm -hmm. in terms of being able to keep three kindergartens at Bishop. So I'm not sure that it, it and, I, and I'll have to sit down after we go through this process to see if it would have made much of a difference. Mm -hmm. We are very tight everywhere mm -hmm. this year. Our, maybe I'm just jumping ahead a little bit in enrollments, but I think our kindergarten class is gonna hit 520, if not more. <laughs> very tight. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, I mean, when I've heard people talk about this, I think people say, are trying to get, can we move some kids out of East Arlington to Bishop, and mm -hmm. then some Bishop kids to Stratton and to Backett, and you know, if we just sort of shift the boundaries a little bit, and so the question is, would that, would expanding the buffer zone uh, potentially help with that? I think that's why I need some time, uh, some reflective time on this, and I'm not sure that's the district where it would make a difference. Now, it might have made a little bit more of a difference well, I think it's clearing up with the Dallin bracket. Uh, the, you know, the, in every single one, there's a, like a little bit where, well, it'd be nice if we could have three students there instead of here. So, but I have to say that all of the, all of the schools are getting up to the numbers we would like not to go over yeah. for our kindergartens. Yes, Mr. Thielen. We get a report on the buffer zones in the, in the fall, fall, right? So I think, mm -hmm. I think that's the time to have for, this discussion. Yeah, for us okay. to get Dr. Bodhi gives us the report, whatever the date, I think October 1 or something like that. In went, October, yeah. I think. So we get the report in October on the buffer zones. Mm -hmm. And then I think at that point in time, we've got to take, maybe, we may have to take some action based on that report. Okay. And, and that would be a referral to the subcommittee mm -hmm. to p potentially expand the buffer zones 
because they have to be expanded by the time that you start doing enrollment in the when, when you, we always do enrollment. Yeah, you're always doing enrollment. But you wouldn't always. but it would be go but the, okay. But if we were to revise the buffer zones they would go into effect for FY We would need to eighteen. They would have to be for the spring. Yeah. Yeah. For the spring. For the spring. And yeah. spring, spring enrollment starts <clears throat> in February. But this is different than the, the last time yeah. it was a look at all of the district lines. Right. This is a, 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 a reef configuration of the buffer zones. We didn't have buffer zones right. last time. We the, po the, the project we did last time, mm -hmm. the effort we put in last time, created the buffer zones. Right. Mm -hmm. So now it's a redefinition of the buffer zones, possibly based on your report in October. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dr. Allison Abbey. I would suggest for that report that it would be helpful if you could work with Adam Kurowski and actually mm -hmm. Do an assessment if you know would widen do answer the question that you're asking would widening the buffer zone right. have allowed you to achieve a different result in the, cl the class mm -hmm. composition mm -hmm. at the different schools right. and I don't know how much time he need I mean I don't know if that's possible it seems possible um, but mm -hmm. I think that would be really informative for us um, you know, because if you find out that no, it wouldn't have made much difference, I'm not yeah. sure where that we would mm -hmm. yeah. right. feel any change. Mr. Harden. Uh, yes, so I had originated this request because if you look at the current year numbers, if you had moved 10 kids out of East Arlington, you could have had seven kindergartens in East Arlington mm -hmm. and, and still had an acceptable 22 or 23 kids per class. So looking at the, the next year's data, obviously we're seeing another bump. So. Is that going to be a continuation or is it a bump? Right. We, we don't know. But, but the point was, if you do have 160, 170 kids in East Arlington, you, uh, kindergarten students in East Arlington, you can manage that with seven classrooms. Once you get over 170, you can't. So we're already over at 100, 170 for next year. And it would be, we wouldn't be able to move that many out. Right. Um, but I think looking forward, you know, we're all looking at Hardy. What are we going to do at Hardy? We need to look at that because the next year, not this September, but the following September, they're not going to. They may not have room, right. um, according to the data we've seen before, unless they, they can find reconfiguration internally to create another room. So, if we want modulars there, we need to know that in September. So, mm -hmm. all of this is, is moving together, mm -hmm. um, and that's why I'd suggested looking at that because it could possibly be a relief valve, obviously for next year. The numbers aren't looking that way, so maybe we, we wait another year. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, but that was the original genesis of the idea. And I also think, you know, it's been three or four years since we've put them in place. The policy does say we're supposed to take a look at it on an annual basis. So, um, you know, I do think in the annual report that we get about the buffer zones, it would be a good time mm -hmm. to, to decide should we do some adjustments or not. Yeah. You may comment. Yes, yeah. Dr. Bay. Um, I agree. I think we need to take a look at it. Um, one of the things that is, um, as I'm sitting back sort of watching this whole process as I'm, we're doing the buffer zones, is that sometimes one of the issues is, is the sequentialness of it. So you make a decision with one student, which then has ramifications going down. Mm -hmm. And if you could do all of the students at one time, then it would be easier to do that kind of but that's not how it works. And so it's sort of thinking about that piece of it also. But I do think that we should look at it and if it's possible that would, would make a, a substantial difference, um, we should consider it because having modulars is a very expensive process as we go forward, for sure. And that is going to be an issue at Hardy. Um, unless we go into common spaces like art and music in in the 17, 18 school year, there isn't an extra classroom. Mr. Hainer. I think something that we talked about way back when, when we weren't sure if this was a bump or a real thing, I think it's real. I think it's going to be, <laughs> Arlington is going to continue to grow no matter what. And the reality is the neighborhood schools are either going to go vertical, five, six floors, which I, I don't think is going to happen, or Districting, it's going to be called the Arlington District eventually. And, and I, I don't mean to make light of it. Uh, I have to, it's a serious thing. But this is something coming down. We keep making these buffer zones, and it may be sufficient for a while, bigger and bigger, but eventually it will be one buffer zone called Arlington. And uh, 
we just don't have it. Uh, it's a, I'm glad it's more on your table than our table. We just have to agree with you one way or the other. I think we should wait until uh, the fall, but I also agree with Mr. Garden. We need the information up front to plan for the following year as soon as possible. So, so I, I would suggest this to be on our first agenda. Yeah, okay, so it September. sounds like we have an idea of how it would be handled if we do it in the fall, which is community relations would mm -hmm. be the, the committee mm -hmm. who would be looking at it with Dr. Bode. Um, okay, good, so that's what I wanted clarity on that. Um, okay, uh, monthly financial reports, we have a vote that's needed. <coughs> so we need a bit of a discussion and an explanation. Scroll through my novice agenda to get to yeah. the right spot here. Sorry about that. Here I am. Keep, okay. keep going. Keep good. Good job. <laughs> Stay ahead of schedule. So we have. Uh, I've done the projections through the end of the year based on the second to the last payroll that was at the beginning of June, and as you see from the summary report, I'm currently projecting that we will be in deficit 277,654, which we can cover from reserves. I went back through all of my paperwork and I didn't find that after we, we've, I found all the paperwork where we voted, we voted the budget in a lump, the revolving and the town appropriation. We didn't do it line by line because at the time the amounts for the contract increases were all in the admin line and right. so we knew right. it wasn't reflected. Right. But I could find no evidence in my documents and I, there wouldn't have been any other place it would have come from but for me. Mm -hmm that we ever went back and voted mm -hmm. it after we did the contracts. Mm -hmm. Got it. So while I did the piece of paper you have on the desk in front of you as if we're making changes subsequent to the contract settlement, in fact, we're just voting these line items for the very first time. Mm -hmm. I see. So, it, but I had finished it before I figured that out. But could, okay. uh, can we yeah, just, yeah, Mr. Oh, sorry. Yeah. can we just take a vote to move from reserve the 277-654, is that? Well, we never did vote, <coughs> according to policy, the, the um, budget transfer lines. Oh. We elected not to last budget cycle because, because the contract amounts were all sitting in the admin line. Right. All right, well. So, so I don't know done. what you want to do. I mean, it's kind of a moot point. <laughs> it's kind of a moot point. I think you just want money in reserve. So, so, so here it looks like, oh, we've saved a lot of money in the admin, but that's not because we really saved a lot of money in the admin. Correct. Because we, it was contracts. just sort of sitting there. And, yeah. Yes. Okay. Mr. Schlippen. We should do the budget transfer. I mean, yeah. that, that's our job. And if we're moving things from line item to line item, it's not only our job, it's our, our responsibility to do it. So I move the uh, uh, budget transfers. Great. Um, can I? As presented. As, as presented, presented by. Second. Ms. Johnson. Um, so a um, uh, motion made by Mr. Schleffman, seconded by Mr. Seelman. Um, can I just ask a quick question first? Do we have to do anything with regard to the amount that was given to us uh, from the Finance Committee that um, the extra amount from um, yeah, Chapter 70 money. Yeah, do we have we, to do? We customarily get grant money finalized over the summer so and we, do we another, we do okay, another thing in the fall when okay. we get all the grants in okay, for thanks. final numbers. And I, I just assume we could do it, but, but I assumed we'd do it all together in excellent. the fall. Thanks, okay. Yes, Mr. Hainer. Being the oldest on the committee and totally forgetful, is this where we usually are every year? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we, we had, you know, I, I really had hoped we would, we would have some, some savings, but the um, three individuals with very long-standing tenure and very old um, policies around sick leave buyback that are now phased out of contracts cost us almost $100,000. And that was an ugly surprise to me. But um, uh, the other, the, basically the other piece of the overage is the, the high school elevator. Right. So we did very well. We came very close, except for those really those two, those two biggies. You when, know, we were right there. Trainer. When you said buyback, you're talking sick leave. Sick leave, yeah. And how many people? Three. And it amounted to one hundred thousand dollars. Ninety-eight something. I thought we had caps on them. We do now, but these people had were of such long tenure they were ahead of that. And the other, the other if I may. Yeah. Uh, circuit breaker. Will that have any effect on this going forward when it comes in? Um, if we get more in the fourth quarter, that will, but remember, circuit right, I understand. that'll be one of the other things we vote. Did you in the bring, fall. Okay. tell us about in September? Right. Thank you. 
And then just a question. I know that we um, added a tiny bit of money to our reserve fund, right, These, in terms of the Special Education Reserve Fund? That's right. We did transfer $135,000 from this year's operating budget to special ed reserves held by town hall, uh, t held by town meeting. And that's reflected in these numbers then? It is indeed. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Mr. Cardin. Um, so you're showing an overage in revolving revenue as compared to budget of, of 36,000. Was that reflected in this or, or, or is that not reflected yet? I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't quite understand your question. In your revolving revenue tracking. Sheet, you're showing uh, 36,000. Second to last Oh, I'm sorry, when I didn't, I forgot to add in circuit breaker. So we're, if you look at the detail on revolving revenue, it's the, uh, Second to last of the pages, um, we are actually tracking thirty-six thousand dollars ahead of, of budget. Right. So is that, does that come out? So that would lower our deficit. No, that that number That's is factored already in. Fig figured in. Yeah. No, I didn't. I didn't put in. I didn't put in the circuit breaker amount, which I usually do on that cover page. That was an error on my part. Thank you for catching it. It's not me. What's chirping? I don't know. Cricket. Um, cricket. Oh. Cricket. Oh, yeah, cricket. <laughs> No. <laughs> Somebody's pet. <laughs> okay, so we need to uh, take a vote. Can I have a motion? We already made it. Oh, we had a motion already. We had a second. Oh, never mind. We did. Okay, so all those in favor? Aye. 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 And I uh, opposed? Oh, abstention. Okay, I thought it was unanimous. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, do is there anything else? Questions about the budget that we want? Well, we have Ms. Johnson. Here with the monthly tracking. Any other questions? Okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Superintendent's report. Actually, we're actually very we're much at time. Keep, keep it. Keep it going. Long <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Yep. That's, I know. I know. We keep, keep on keeping on. on. Keep on keeping on. No, no, that doesn't mean you take the whole time. <laughs> no, 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 there's a lot to discuss, actually. I understand. Yeah. There's a lot. <laughs> All right. So there's a lot of bullets here, but there's also um, some other things that I have as well. It is the last meeting. There's a lot it's to... It's the last meeting, exactly. Yes. All right. So some of these will actually be very quick. Um, Arlington High School building update. We have been in communication with um, our representative, our, our, our liaison from MSBA. We're going to be setting up some meetings. Uh, I believe we've already begun doing, doing some of the um, work that's involved in the reports. And that's about where we are at the moment. Um, nothing, nothing much to say there, unless there's any questions. Okay. Thompson School Building Design Update. Can, oh, you put the dashboard. Well, let's do that. That's dashboard? Not, that, we can do that. We can do the dashboard. Okay, and that's actually not here, so we... No, sure dashboard's on. not on yeah, here, yeah. but I was gonna, it's on my list. Yes, great. So this is the thing that we think it will be finished by the end of the summer, is there the expectation, what I understand? So would the superintendent, that, uh, superintendent, would you take the microphone? I'm sure will. It's the other one. It won't. You have to. Well, this was, this, um, where we are with the dashboard was presented to the Community Relations Subcommittee. Um, before there was just a, uh, just a long, uh, long list of different graphs, but what Julie Dunn and Claudia Bertoli have done is actually gather the different uh, picture graphs, graphs into different files. And these are the icons for those files. And we can go through and see, uh, see what some of them are. Some of these graphs you've seen in the past and some of them are, are new, are new graphs, and, and we may even have more. The thing about this, you, you don't want to think that this is a finished product. Uh, rather than have it be perfect, 
I think that it would be better to at least get it up on the website sometime this summer. And we can always add to it. In fact, some of the data is going to have to be changed anyway as we go forward. So there is an introduction uh, which explains what the dashboard, uh, what the dashboard is. If you go, <clears throat> is that the, that's the introduction. So the next one is enrollment. And there are a number of graphs here um, that describe enrollment. We don't have to go through each one of them. But we, we, right now, I can't give you the link because for technical reasons. But you can just get a sense of what these different graphs will look like on the enrollment, looking at it from different kinds of lenses. Again, some of these you have seen before, um, but I don't think you've seen the way it's been expressed sometimes in the bar graph. If you go on to the next icon, well, the next one is budget information. And these graphs you're familiar with, these are graphs we've had in the budget report, the report to town meeting. And there may be some other ones we might want to consider having in there. As I said, these things can be updated and then just put back up on the, on the website. But it just gives, an, it gives people an idea of, one, what, where our revenue sources are and what our expenses. And by the way, um, I'll talk about the math fair later on, but seeing these two graphs reminded me of one of the projects. Um, three ninth grade students did a, a math fair project on our budget. Oh, that's so awesome. And they use these graphs. We're hoping to get this up on a, on a website, but they were quite knowledgeable and thinking about also what the effect of enrollment is going to be on our budget and how perhaps the cost per student might go down if we have this trajectory. It was very, it was excellent, mm. excellent. Uh, in fact, it would be very interesting to have them come and present yeah, yeah. their ideas. But you know, the, the math there was just this morning. But anyway, they use both of these graphs to explain what revenue and exp what the what the percentages were for revenue and expenses. All right. So the next one are student outcome. and you know, this is um, our MCAS data. Now, one of the suggestions that came at the meeting was to disaggregate this graph into three parts because it's too complicated to understand and that's something that's going to be a project that's going to be be done so you'll probably see three different graphs showing the trend lines of our performance in math ELA in comparison to the state Then there's the issue of staffing. And can't take this. This issue of staffing here. And so what this is is the ratio Arlington Public Schools to teacher ratio and then state students, which is the second bar graph, uh, uh, students to teacher ratio. And each one of the bar graphs corresponds to a different year. So the, the darker blue on the left is the 1512. Now, one of the things that's very clear in the Arlington is that we had this spike there. In other words, we had a lot more students for each teacher um, back in the year of 2013-14. And one of the things that we've been seeing over the last three budget, or the last two budget years, and uh, is looking at and looking at what is that ratio? And fortunately, students to teacher is starting to come down. Uh, we don't have the data up there for 1617 yet, for because we're not there yet. But the other thing that is interesting is looking at the state and how the ratio there of students to teacher is lower than than, than we are. And so again, I, it's just more evidence of, um, you know, that we get outstanding performance and achievement for our students, and yet, in terms of the ratio for teachers, it's 
It's quite much higher than the state. And, you know, Dr. Janger was here today talking about what the average class load is for a high school teacher. 100 to 130 students is a lot if you're going to give students the attention um, that they deserve. Now, to our teacher's credit, who are very dedicated and they do it anyway. It's just, it's just a lot of students. And, and clearly, there's only so much time in a day to give all students um, individual attention. All right, so that's that icon. Then the last one over here is uh, technology, and this one is pending. And uh, Dr. Chesson may want to say a little bit about what we might have in that particular um, uh, part of the dashboard. Sure, we're going to be looking at um, devices over time, and then uh, the ratio of devices to students, and then also talk about our uh, capacity and the internet. So there'll be three um, charts that are associated with that. And I know there was some uh, discussion in community relations of changes and additions, and I assume that all will happen over the summer, and we'll see some difference. Okay. So uh, that's what you're, that's what the dashboard is looking like right now. Yeah. And in those areas, if you think of any type of way, or you you're doodling over the summer and want to come up with a, a, a graph, we could certainly look at inserting it. I think these are broad enough categories in terms of where we're going to have the data, but again, it may be that there's another category that we should, we should take a look at. So that's what it is. So a dashboard for people listening is supposed to be a quick visual in which you can understand key information about a district. That's what it is. And so you're, you're going to see it in terms of graphs, not narrative not charts, but rather bar graphs, circle graphs, um, line graphs, that type of thing. All right? I know, I know Mr. Thielman wanted to, to get, a, get a sense of Thank what it you. looks like. I yeah. did. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I thought, yeah, that's good. <clears throat> good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So now, actually, I should go back to there, because next is the Thompson School Building Design Update. We're on a very fast track um, if we are able to, with the ultimate goal of having an addition on the Thompson Elementary. As enrollment has grown, for those listening for the first time about this, um, our situation is that we're going to need, in the years ahead, four classrooms per grade. <coughs> Presently, there are 19, so we need five more. Now, as we've gone through discussions about this um, over the last couple of months, you know, there's been discussions about should we increase core spaces, um, such as the cafeteria and the, the gym area. And that was something that was seriously considered. Another, issue, another idea was should we have, if we're going to have six rooms, could one of the rooms be much larger so that it could be an alternate space? space, particularly for a gym area, um, that would be a sort of a, a less of an active kind of a gym, more of a, I use yoga, but it could be something similar to that. And so in thinking about this, um, some thought, as I said, was given to cafeteria and the gym, but realistically, the cost to add on to those spaces is not worth the small benefit that you would get. For the cafeteria, for educational reasons, the principal of, the, of, the, of Thompson wants to have students go out and have recess before they have lunch. And actually, lots of research says that this is the, what is the ideal um, sequence for kids if, they wanna, if you want them to eat lunch. Because if you reverse it, they are eating quickly, sometimes not eating their lunch, going out to recess, and then they're coming back all charged up. Mm -hmm. So our schools, to the extent that they've been able to, are trying to have recess first. Now, the problem with recess first is it's not, you don't even want to have, if you don't want to have two classes outside at the same time, if you can avoid it, because that's a lot of students. Um, if you have 80 students in class, you could have 160 students out there. So 
that isn't even the ideal. So that the way it's organized is you have recess, that class comes in for lunch, and then there's just this constant uh, cycling of that. And that pattern's not gonna change even if we increase the cafeteria space because of that other reason. And so it didn't make any sense to add on when adding on would not uh, benefit, uh, benefit the school in any way. But, but it made sense to have an addition that would be a little bit larger so that we could accommodate a large room. But one of the other things that occurred as we were through these discussions, as enrollment goes up at Thompson, one of the other things that is going to be need to increase as well is some special education breakout areas or little offices or ELL. Right now we have both levels of ELL um, in, the same, in the same room. So in this new design that was pr brought forward to teachers, um, discussed with parents last week, and then this Tuesday night was brought to the Permanent Town Building Committee, is this design here. And they're all the same, right? No. No? Yeah, the garden, the garden yeah these are different. Second um, and third floor are going floors. to have a breakout room in the middle. Yeah, well, we can go to the, the addition is going to be on the wing. The wing of the school is going to come straight out and go the whole width of the school. One of the early documents we had about Thompson, and we were looking at square footage, uh, if, you remember, if you go back to the space needs study and all that, the proposal was 6,000 square feet, six classrooms and a hall. But again, it is, it has evolved in the thinking about this project and some of the other space needs that we've had, this project's now more like 7,800 square feet. So the addition is going the entire width. Because the, if you, when you've been in Thompson, you'll know that it, it, it's not a long hallway with classrooms off of the hallway. There are some, ind there are some indentations so that the, you can have breakout rooms. So by putting it the entire length, of the width of the building, you create some extra space. And is there a way to roll, roll that a little bit, Karen? So we can see the design. I think slide. just roll there's down. Another slide. There's another slide. There yeah, there you go. There we go. Here's your three floors. Okay. So in this, on the first floor, because of code, you have to go be able to go outside. So you have to have a you know a straight shot out for an exit mm -hmm. door. But in doing that, you can still do that and have this room here extended, it would give us over 1,200 square feet for a room. And that is, you know, bigger than a kindergarten. So it would be a nice, really nice size room that we could have. Now when you go up to the second floor, what happens, here's a good example, here's an example on the third floor that I can actually reach to. You've got the classroom, you have a breakout room, and you have another classroom. So this room here is actually a fairly substantial room that could be, as I said, a uh, special education room, it could be ELL, but one of the suggestions that teachers had is that there is connecting door here, connecting door there, so you could actually also use it for uh, students to go out into that space. The other suggestion that had been made, and I, I believe that it's possible to do and it's gonna be it's going to happen is to have a connecting door this way as well so that it, it's true in all of the rooms we can connect straight through that way um, a teacher here could open the door and there could be some sharing now that's a little bit more complicated because this is the exterior wall of Thompson mm -hmm. and that is masonry so it's going to be uh, a little tricky in terms of how that would um, be done, but um, Ms. Coles, who is the architect, explained. She said, the she said the other night that they'd do that on uh, uh, Christmas vacation, or just prior to school, do a cut, board it up, heat it. Next vacation, do another cut, and board it up, and heat it. And uh, 
as a teacher, I thought it'd be great to put plexiglass in that so the kids could look through, but no. <laughs> she said, no, you can't do that. Yeah, and as you also know from being at Thompson, there is a really lovely glass wall here at the end by the mm -hmm. staircase. And the, the hope is that whole wall can be just taken out, because it's only two years old, um, and moved over here. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the goal. Um, and because you, you've got the staircase here and you have all the toilets on this floor, there's sufficient, in fact, there's, you could even build on another addition, she said. Uh, we don't want to do that. But, um, <laughs> We have, plenty, we have plenty of infrastructure, and the staircase is right there. So there's a committee that's going to be formed of parents and teachers, because there's going to be issues that are going to come up next year um, in just terms of movement around the site. Because it's, you know, assuming that we're able to go forward with this project, and that's, that's not yet. I mean, we have the voters are being asked if they would be willing to fund it, but it also has to be appropriated. Mm -hmm. So we had to go back to town meeting in the fall on this, and the task force had wanted to take a look at enrollment just to make sure that um, we're, in fact, on this trajectory of increase. Because last year, as you recall, we had a little bit of a dip, but we're making up for it <laughs> this year. Um, so this is what it's looking like right now. Now, I can talk in a second about the timeline which is tight, the t very tight. So, uh, uh, um, the construction on this will take 10 months. So you back that up, you have to be ready, really, in November 1st to break ground. Which means that, again, keep backing everything up, um, we, need to, we need to have the designs done on the school by August, late, mid-August, so, or late August, so that we can then go out to bid for um, OPM, Owners Project Manager, and construction. Now, the, the, those awards don't have to be made. They can go out to bid. It would be contingent on town meeting and of course, that's all contingent on what happens next week as well. But if, if all went as planned, we could have the design done by the end of the summer, go out to bid, go to town meeting, award the bids, and be ready for construction. Now, the thing about, you have to remember next year, it's going to be a challenging site. Construction is going to be going on on that end of the school with construction fencing. If you've been up to, to Stratton, you know what I mean, that it's really quite intrusive to the space, but it's, that's the way it, it is. And then on the front lawn, there is modular building. So this committee is gonna be helpful you know, to, to work on a lot of the logistics of, of just how kids come in and recess and all, all those issues. One of the things I think we or you or the administration have to be very cognizant of when that building was being done, the students were not there. Mm -hmm. They were spread out over town. Yes. Traffic today with the existing thing is traumatic going up uh, North Union and around that building. It's, it's really dangerous. With construction going on and stuff, and I know the, the construction people and the contracts are going to take this in, but I, I would ask you and to uh, Mr. Spiegel to look at whether police or whatever is necessary to be there of making those streets potentially for during this period and I don't know if this is a solution one way going well, each way we know that we're going to need another traffic supervisor down there hmm. on the far corner for sure uh, just like at Stratton we're going to need a traffic supervisor up uh, up there as well and that, that's going to be one of the challenges this summer to get that all in place. Mr. Sussman has. First of all, I want, I want to say that Mr. Hainer raises a very important point, so I'd like to move that we uh, ask the uh, Transportation Advisory Committee to look at uh, one-way street patterns and other options around the Thompson School. Is that a motion or is this, okay, motion. Second. So motion by Mr. Sussman, seconded by Mr. Hainer. Discussion on the motion? No. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, and secondly, uh, I'd love to have a copy of this so I can look yeah. at it. Uh, it's very sure. hard to read. 
especially with the very pretty font in, in the uh, shaded yeah. area. I'll definitely send it to you. But keep in mind, this is this draft. Yeah, I, right. I understand. Okay. Yeah, 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 I'll be happy to send it to you. Uh, but it's uh, it's on the table. It's on our screen, so yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, it'd be easier to look at, and you can open. You know, you can pull it open a little bit more. And, yeah. mm -hmm. and then at the at the meeting on Tuesday night, um, Ms. Coles and Ms. Green, who's the other architect for HMFH. Mm -hmm. Um, looked at the gym in terms of how many chairs and people can get in, what's the code on it, and regardless, as long as you have two doors, even if the two doors in terms of inches would allow more people in the gym, the fact that there's two puts 500 as the cap. We're not at 500 yet, but we're going to be heading to 500. So th there's more thought that has to be made about this issue as well. Now, having said that, the truth of the matter is we don't have, har most of our elementary schools can't have every parent there either. Mm -hmm. uh, and some schools are actually pretty small. Is, is there any other school that can't have every kid in the space? Is that true about any other school? Well, we're getting there. No, because I think the number was actually smaller than 500 because of the square footage. It was, there was a lot of big discussion back and forth that it was. The, the square footage was, that was presented was by code is seven square feet, yeah. whether it's a chair or a little right. kindergarten. Right, so I think they came to have 480 or something. So 483 was what was presented by the architect yeah. the other night. And I mean, the issue comes when you're doing programs. You not only have a child in the program, yeah, you got one or two parents. So or a teacher. So you give it an right. all school program. So. Is there are there other schools that have that situation where they can't have an all school assembly with teachers? I don't want to answer that. Okay. Well, I, I can't answer a, that question right now. A potential solution for Thompson was, it, and Mr. Nato was thinking about it, is she put some of the did their all school things in the round and put some of them up in the stage area. That would be allowed on the code. So kids could sit on stage. Right. Whatever, but. So oh. anyway, th this is where we are right now, and the architect, uh, architects are going to come back June 21st to meet with this subcommittee that has been formed at Thompson to go over where we are so that on June 21st, that's it. We're done. We're, we're moving forward with the design, and then they have the summer to work on it. Yeah. So... I just want to say, um, when I've heard people talk about common spaces, it's not usually cafeteria, it is this all-school assembly, and there's this issue about if you bring a program in as a PTO, for example, yeah. that you can't, if you can't get every kid in there, you have to bring the program twice. You know, and that, that gets very problem, sort of but, difficult well, to, mm -hmm. to work around. I don't, as an elementary teacher for 28 years, we always had two programs for all those, yeah. just for that reason. Uh, in, in brand new schools. It's just twice school. as much. I know, understand. That, no, know, I understand. It, yeah. they, it, it would be, you get twice as many programs if you can get them come in for one show right. like that. Right. The other part is sometimes the programs are also geared primary sure. and upper. So that I agree with you. Financially, it would be great to have just one show. Right. Um, we're not there yet at Thompson, so they can do the single program. And, and some of our schools have small, uh, to be honest, I, do I think that we observe the seven square feet for every child in all of our gyms for, for our school programs? No. But, you know, you're looking at the math of it. I mean, that's how it's calculated. And, and another possibility in this whole situation might be to find a way to put another door in. That, that wouldn't solve the 43 number. It wouldn't change the 43. It wouldn't change the 43 from what I understand. I mean, that, from that discussion. You, you yeah, it's, a, it's square, square footage. Feet. The yeah, only way yeah. you're going to go beyond that. Yeah, yeah. Right. Anyway. But, yeah. Okay, so any questions on Thompson, where we are there? Is there, um, so mm -hmm. do you want to tell us about the presentation that you made to parents, and there's another presentation? Well, we did. We did. It was back to back. It was, it was teachers in the afternoon, parents in the evening. Um, nice turnout for parents and teachers as well and some people have volunteered to be on this subcommittee to meet again but all parents are welcome to the meeting we'll, we'll make sure people know about the time and uh, that'll be on the 21st mm -hmm. and then we're going forward okay great Stratton um, 
Stratton is moving along. I don't think there's anything to report uh, other than they're even now picking out colors of roof tiles. <laughs> so that, that's a good sign that you were, you were really moving along. I, I, there's there's been no issues. I understand from actually being up there last week, talking to the crew outside, that all the modular units are up in this area. They're sitting out in Littleton or someplace like that. And so they're yeah. here. They're not coming up. I was yeah, told that another one arrived this afternoon. The kids saw it while they were on the playground. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, what, one of the challenges of these modulars has been the, the location of Stratton up on this hill and yeah. coming around some of the corners. Oh, yeah. Coming up the hill and then the corners. One of them was made to literally back up and reapproach. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think, um, I think they've had to think about some new routes. Um, but anyway, that's, that's been a challenge mm -hmm. for sure. Okay, enrollment update. Uh, you had the latest numbers, and they really, I, I don't, I'll certainly give you an update on Friday, but right now, confirmed in our, in our kindergarten, we have 491 with 19 pending. I will say that just two days ago, we moved some of the pending into different, we moved about eight or 10 of those into schools because they were buffer zones. So right now, we're at, um, Five ten, if we count both. Is that counting all the kids that we know of at this point? No. Okay. No, I had a, we had a meeting on Monday with the elementary principals, and most said that they know if even people who have children in the school that haven't registered their incoming kindergarten. So let me just put a plea out there. <laughs> <laughs> Please register your your son or daughter, so we, so we know. Cause we're, we're trying to make some decisions about teaching assistance, and we would rather make them now than wait a month or two, so. All right, I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Chesson to talk about summer um, professional development. Uh, so summer professional development falls into uh, two categories, one is, um, work on curriculum and learning about curriculum, and the other one is professional development that helps teachers grow as professionals. So we'll be spending a lot of time this summer on our, our new initiatives or expansion of current curriculum initiatives. For example, FOSS, which is the science program, will be um, having professional development for grades four and five. Math um, is going to be getting, as Mr. Coleman told you several weeks ago, um, a, new a new version of investigations for grades K and one. Um, we have had Lucy Calkins for quite some time. We're fine tuning that, but we're um, also looking at our new reading units and how those are integrated with Lucy Calkins too and how writing and reading are, as you heard from this evening, are integrated. Um, those would be actually K through five. Um, and then as uh, Mr. Conklin told you, I think the first presentation that we had on curriculum, in social studies, we're gonna be doing some alignment at the elementary school level, and also, as you heard discussed tonight, um, some integrated units with social studies and English language arts. Um, there's also a significant amount of um, content-specific uh, professional development that's happening for secondary level teachers. Um, two things that we're having this summer for our teachers uh, that I think are a particular note, um, our school leadership teams, uh, that are often referred to as ILTs, instructional leadership teams, will have an opportunity to um, grow as teams and have professional development <coughs> sponsored um, by Teachers 21 uh, at the, towards the end of August. And additional, um, we'll be starting our year-long uh, supporting instruction course that will be for our teacher leaders within the building um, that is uh, supported in part by AEF. And finally, the last thing is we're going to be running some ed camps this summer for technology um, or tech and practices, <coughs> we'd like to refer. Um, that will also be in August. Um, that w is for all teachers, but specifically uh, or especially for those teachers at Thompson, I'm sorry, at Audison and at the high school because they will be going BYOD next year. Okay. Um, and it just uh, to let you know, we will also be offering professional development for those staffs. Um, right embedded in the school day because we have a person at Audison that's freed up uh, three periods a day to do that. We also have Susan Bisson who's freed up uh, across the district to do that instructional technology work and we'll also be running some after school 
um, professional development. We've actually run a number of professional developments already, but this is since it's you know when it's right in front of people, sometimes they have more impetus to go for professional development. Mr. Hainer. Are we up to date? Is everybody that's supposed to have the retail done? Um, we have a small number of teachers who, through no fault of their own, uh, were unable to get the course. Um, the State Department of Education has notified us that they actually have a small grant to continue the retail training for next year. Um, and I will be sending out, we just agreed, I'll bet reluctantly, um, to um, offer one of those classes here um, at, for the convenience of our teachers in the fall. And so um, teachers will, those teachers who have not been able to get into a course at to the, up to this point will have the opportunity to take it here. Just a quick follow up, and I, I don't even know if we can. Can we make that a condition of employment going forward? Unless they're brand new teachers. In other words, if we're hiring a teacher that's got four or five years experience and stuff like that, uh, I, in other words, so that we don't get hit with the bill. I, I appreciate brand new teachers, you know, coming straight out of college and stuff. I, I Actually, think they're this, coming to us with the SEI, SEI endorsement. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. The only, uh, there are a few teachers that we have hired who don't have it at this point, um, who've come from other states um, and have in Massachusetts a preliminary license, which you can still get without it, but you can't okay. get an initial license as a core teacher now, as a new teacher without it. But the burden then comes for us to provide, or how has that worked out? I don't know. I'm, I'm not trying to deny anybody anything, but I don't want us to get in trouble either. The only thing that I can say for sure is that we have an agreement with um, the AEA that any teacher that was hired as of July 1st of last year? Was it last, last year? year? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's it into you. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, receives the stipend and mm -hmm. receives the training. Okay. I'm just thinking going forward that, I mean, we, we've done due diligence in getting our current staff up on, based on the, on the state. I mean, I think the state <laughs> in its licensure in teacher preparation and they should make that part of the curriculum. They are. They do. They, they do. do. But if they're not from Massachusetts, then, then they, they won't have them. Okay. Actually, can you just say a little bit something about um, BYOD because we haven't heard that as a public. Maybe some people have heard about it, and some people haven't. Uh, okay, so um, bring your own device is going to be. Um, um, it's kind of been flying under the radar. Kids mm -hmm. could bring it in, um, bring a device in, and we would put it on the guest network, but we wouldn't allow it on the actual network. Um, starting next year uh, at the high school, uh, students may bring in either an iPad, um, a Chromebook, or a MacBook. Um, and they can um, bring it in and they have to sign an acceptable use policy. There was actually a meeting at the high school last night for the high school uh, people um, uh, about this, par this process. They sign a special um, acceptable use policy and then uh, they're allowed <coughs> to get on the regular network. Um, we've had BYOD all year at, for sixth grade at the um, middle school. It's been very successful. Um, we haven't had any problems. But only one kind of device, so that was different. But only one kind of device. So um, next year, um, we'll still have one kind of device at sixth grade um, because it's one-to-one -one and they're mm -hmm. provided with a device if they don't bring one. Um, but at seventh and eighth grade, uh, students can again bring either an iPad, mm -hmm. um, they can bring a Chromebook, or they can bring a MacBook. Those devices were chosen because of the lack of bringing in uh, outside viruses to the system and also because of the battery life and the startup time. Um, as much as many of us like our Dell laptops, they take a while to start up and when a teacher only has 52 minutes in a classroom, they can't wait. Uh, Dr. Allison Abbey. I'm not sure that the high school has pushed out what the BYOD yeah, devices different. would be. I mean, I haven't seen that. I, know. I mean, yeah. I saw a reference to it, but we haven't gotten the it was, full. Well, I saw reference to the BYOD, but nothing about what the devices yeah. could be. So I'm just that's wondering true. when that's going to be um, coming the, out. The information that was provided to me that I looked at and approved um, included that discussion that was handed out last night. Last oh. night. That what, was last night, but there will you, be a. There I don't be, actually remember anything last night either. Do you? Was that, was that uh, they, what, they showed me what they were supposedly handing out. I have to okay. admit I was not there, uh, um, but they did show me what they were handing out, and that included the three devices. However, there will be um, subsequent meetings in the summertime at the high school as well as in okay. the middle school. Right. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't able to come 
to right. attend last night either. And so I guess the question is, when is it going out to parents who, you know, all parents? There at, at, yeah, yeah, I will, yeah. I will check with the high school. They um, are handling that on their own. Okay. Um, the middle school will have um, a number of meetings over the summer that parents can come to. Um, it's not as new for the middle school because we had a, a couple of BYOD meetings, although it was just one device last year, um, last summer. And we found that that was actually, if we went by that, we would have thought no one was going to bring anything. And then when we advertised, if you want to bring a device you should come this night we all of a sudden had 60 people so we found that when it's like a reality bring your device you can be there so we'll send the information home to the middle school and then the meeting will happen um, when people can actually bring in their device mr. Hainer students that we have to provide for they're not allowed to take those home am I correct that's correct how does that affect product and stuff like that uh, I mean are teachers sensitive to that when yes. on assignments and <clears throat> extremely stuff extremely so yes okay Thank so, you. So actually, is it our um, anticipation that every student will be using at the high school level a device more, much more integrated into their, their schoolwork, mm -hmm. um, either that they brought themselves or that has been provided to them in school? As to the largest extent possible, yeah. given our financial constraints, I would say yes. Okay. And actually, I think this came up last year. Um, if parents do contribute a device, if they're able to, if they have the funds mm -hmm. and they are able to contribute a device, it really helps our budget. So, so, it certainly uh, so certainly not all families can afford this, and we understand that. But if, if you feel that you do have the ability, um, this just makes it much easier for us to operate as a system. And that's one another reason why we chose those three devices because they're at three different price points. Is, is, if I may, yeah, is there any hand. thought going forward not trying to let the parents? buy them on time or something through a, through way back when I remember Apple had something at one time for colleges and universities uh, and certainly if you have a student that's at the college level you can get a discount right um, uh, there is no thought at this point some districts have done that there's some muddy waters about how um, okay appropriate that is thank you Thanks. mr. Slippin. Um, BYOD, how about school committee? <laughs> We're on APS guest, I believe. Um, yes. Provided you have one of those three devices and you sign an acceptable use policy, I see no reason why you can't be on the school network. <laughs> <laughs> I think he does. I wouldn't let him on. That's <laughs> all we've been asking for. <laughs> <laughs> I can get email. You guys, yeah, I don't know. I can't get email. Can't, yeah. Is that why? I yeah. don't know. There's I, a maybe ton of I things I can't on do on it. I don't know. Because I've, the I, every time it comes yeah. up, I've agreed to I'll, everything. I'll, and I'll talk to Mr. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Thanks. Anything else? Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So um, Mr. Spiegel is going to talk about our hiring update. So uh, we're very active right now in district hiring. Um, we're really in the midst of it. Um, so far, though, we have finalized the appointment. Uh, and when I say finalized, the people, new people who are going into teaching positions who have not been in teaching positions before in the district, who are hired as teachers under the AEA bargaining unit, um, who I've met with and gone over all the uh, benefits and policies. We have nine people so far who have gone through that process. I'm meeting with three more people next week. Of, those, of the nine people I've already met with, five of them have already worked for the district in some capacity, either as long-term subs or uh, mostly as long-term subs or teaching assistants. And a couple of them have done their student teaching here. And so we have, a, you know, as I've said before, we tend to hire, some of our principals like to hire people who they get to know through either long-term sub or student teaching or teaching assistant positions. And that's a great way for people who are getting licensed or you know, go, going back to grad school to get some experience working with kids. And then um, you know, if they perform well and there are jobs available, they tend to get hired here. So that's, that's good. We have, new we have filled the, um, the split cluster position it, uh, positions at Audison, um, both the social studies English um, cluster, that's the eighth grade teacher who will be teaching both social studies and English is licensed in both. And we've hired the science math teacher <coughs> licensed in middle school math science. Both of those teachers um, who we hired are people who have done long-term sub assignments this year at the Audison. So they are well known to the staff and the students already. Um, so we're progressing, we're hiring 
we uh, filled some math positions that were open at the high school, um, a point four Latin, um, special ed at the high school, uh, a second grade position at Hardy, and a science position at the high school, and a history position at the high school. So we've, uh, um, yeah, so we're sort of spread out. We have more people coming in in the, some of the elementary positions that are open up. I also want to say that we have, I th at my count right now, currently, is 13 teachers who are shifting from one position to another, either in the same building in a different grade, or from one building to another, um, or sometimes in the same building with a different, some, maybe they're in a special ed teacher and going to a different special ed program in the same building. Um, so we do have some movement, and we are still having some movement. Um, in the district and we do we're in a kind of a it's a little volatile right now because a lot of our teaching assistants now and some teachers are also we've gotten some some recent resignations not a lot I don't think we have a ton of turnover but it happens every year that there's people who have to move away for uh, family reasons or or some people who get a job somewhere else and I'm having I'm going through exit interview processes with uh, trying to do with all the people who are leaving um, for whatever reason and um, so as there's gonna be a lot of shifting in the next you know all summer between T TAs who are leaving because they're getting jobs somewhere else as teachers or going back to grad school or doing something or moving away and filling those positions that there'll be a lot of hiring this summer and then there's, there will be some other positions in the teaching um, and some administrators to fill still Yes, Mr. Hainer. Are there any impact on diversity? Yeah. There is. I, I'm not ready to, um, to to give you the numbers, but we there is some positive impact on diversity in the district. Um, and um, you know, we've been talking a lot about um, <laughs> that yeah, as we have talked about how we're going to roll out um, the administrator training. Um, next year and you know we're looking at diversity in a lot of different ways Thank you. So, yeah. okay a few more things um, graduation I actually should have brought this up with dr. Jenger here but it was a beautiful day mm -hmm. beautiful Sarah um, dr. Seuss did a great job in her greetings to the graduates and you know thank you mr. Thielman for coming um, and th some of you were watching so it was it was a lovely day one of the things that there's a change in the program this year they're trying to cut down on speakers and time it used to be an inter somebody introducing every speaker and that's the part that's sort of been reduced but we have um, another big change this year is we've gone to a single color cap and gown oh, right. that's, I know <laughs> it's it was something long overdue, but it's been done, and everyone was, seemed to be pretty pleased about it. So we have extra copies of this we should get you. I, I yeah, don't I think know we, we have got them. Good, we all, good. Yeah, we have to, yeah. got them. And you can see all of the different awards. We have a number of students that are getting large scholarships, and in fact, these are just the awards that we are giving, and some of them are small, some of them are books, but there's still recognitions of, of high, you know, of achievement, and but this coming week is also dollars for scholars, which is the um, effort by the community to raise money for more scholarships. And I think they have, I don't know the exact number, but it's certainly in the hundreds of thousands of dollars that are going to get distributed. And in fact, this week we had a book award day for juniors. And we have underclassmen awards after the seniors leave, and some of those are book awards in which students get some very significant scholarships, hundreds of thousands of dollars of scholarships. And so we had a reception up here just the, um, the other day and for the, for the juniors that were receiving these. Um, you know, one of them is a $100,000 over four years to um, What's the Polytechnic? Oh, oh, yeah, was there? Yeah. yeah. So I mean, there's a lot of great, and in, in, in Rochester, Rochester University mm -hmm. has, as well, has given us scholarship money. So our students did very well. They were, um, I, I understand, last blast went well. That's always good. But anyway, it was, <coughs> it was lovely. 
Um, moving on, um, today we had a reception, our annual reception to recognize mm -hmm. teachers who are retiring, teachers in certain milestones, and also teachers who have received professional status. And it's, it's actually my favorite event, and Linda helps me out with giving um, a little, some, some words about each one of the retirees. But I also want to thank um, Suze for coming and Ms. Starks for coming. Uh, I didn't quite see you, to, to see you were hiding way back up, back in the corner, <laughs> but she came to, to be there as well. It means a lot to teachers to have members of the committee there, so that was <coughs> terrific. But I do, I, I think that it would be um, important just to say to the, to the public who some of these people are, because they have been very special people in, oh, I'll look for my pillow. thank you, please smile. Very special people and have given so much. So I want to do two things. I won't go through who attained professional status, but I will talk about the milestone years. We had Mark Miano. Now, what's not here, we, we omitted accidentally, was uh, Rick Ionelli, but he is also recognized for retiring. Mark Miano, I think most of you know, has been the superintendent of school facilities, for that matter, town facilities. Mm -hmm. How he manages, all he has managed over the years is amazing. And he, he doesn't look like he's been here for 35 years, I have to say. <laughs> you know, for the stresses he's gone through, he, he does not look like yes, it. That's, yes. that's it, because he just always remains so Probably calm through whatever the 10. crisis might be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then Rick Ionelli, who just retired as our director of transportation. Um, in food services, we had um, Anna DeForte, she's down at Thompson, and Maury Montgomery, who was a teacher at Pierce School. For 25 years of service, is Katie Armstrong at Thompson School, Ruth Pickering, who is a speech language pathologist at Hardy School. And then the, the other a benchmark is 20 years, and we have Amy Costello, who I know some of you at this table know, a teacher at Brackett, Karen Gillis, who is administrative assistant at the Addison Middle, Colleen Gorman, a teacher at Brackett, who in the past has been named uh, by the senior class to get spe special recognition, and Linda Tomlinson, who is a math teacher at Audison. So that's terrific. And I just want to say who is retiring this, this year. Actually, some, some of these may have retired last year, but were later in the, and were not part of this uh, recognition. Um, uh, Martha Bennis, who is a nurse at Stratton. Frank Burgess, who has been the custodian at the Arlington High School for I don't know, uh, third, third, it's 41 years, I think. It's, it's an amazing contribution. June Byrne, who has been a kindergarten teacher at Down for, um, she was actually one of the people we acknowledge, well, we, she's, I think it's been here 30 some years, something like that, 25, 25 years. Dave Dempsey, who retired as special education coordinator at the high school last year. Al Flanders, who's a math teacher at the high school. Uh, Dennis Geller, a math teacher at the high school, though he's coming back for a little point two next year. Fill a gap. Our director of transportation, Rick Ionelli. Uh, Marilyn Ford. Uh, and Marilyn uh, Ford, who is food services. Paula Martell, who is a traffic supervisor. Nancy Muse, an art teacher at the high school. She retired mid-year. Uh, Debbie uh, McIvan Pilek, who is a kindergarten teacher at Hardy. Jill Parkin, special education coordinator uh, at the elementary level, and Alicia Taft, who has been our special education out of district coordinator. So I, I'm hoping that they felt um, uh, celebrated because their contributions have been huge. To say one of the fun jobs I had this morning is running around and giving corsages to, <laughs> to all the teachers, and um, just real pleasure job to do as the chair. I just want to add, I don't know whether he wants to be recognized, Mr. Flynn has also participated in the polar plunge with me yeah. this past year. <laughs> he so did. I didn't realize that. He helped raise money to fight yeah. polio. Well, he is a, um, is prop, it was a, is a rower, in fact, a, a very world-class rower, and he's also a coach, so he's sort of moving into that uh, passion of his. 
Um, a couple quick things. Uh, the, the Addison Middle School had to do their concerts in two different nights because of the, the size. Outstanding. Really, they were, this one this Tuesday, they were, they were all very good, but the one this, I don't want to pick out one more than the other, but the quality of singing was excellent. And so, my, so congratulations to the music department at the middle school. The boys ensemble uh, received a gold medal at a competition on Friday. So we'll get more information for you on that. And then um, Tino D'Agostino was again invited this year uh, because his jazz band is, is just extraordinary to the Italian Institute oh, yeah. to celebrate Italy's uh, reunification, which is an annual event. And they were, um, I went to it, they were, they made us all very proud in terms of how well they performed. I could hear people saying, they're so good. <laughs> and they are, they're very good. And then lastly, um, I think lastly, lastly, today was the math fair. I mentioned one of these, but there, there was another project I, I, we, we have, I don't know if we can put it on the website because it has a students in it, but we're working on that issue. But uh, these students, you know, you know, wanted to think, of, wanted to figure out how many green pieces of turf were out in our turf field. Ooh. Interesting. Yes. It was interesting. You mean like strip blades of grass? Yes. Wow. Single blades of turf grass. Exactly blades of so. turf. Okay. You want to take a wild guess as to blades how many of there are? Turf grass. Roughly so. I mean, you know, the rounded number. One and a half million. Huh? One and a half million. One and a half million. I'm saying half a billion. Oh, I know it's one more. 25 million. <laughs> 45 million. Anybody what do we get if we guess it right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're not even close. Really? <laughs> yeah. No, it's, uh, it's in the 470 million That's why I said half a billion. Half a billion. Wow. Half a billion. Wow. Half she a said billion. half a billion. Half Good half idea. Billion. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're close. You win the prize. You get to go out and pick any take plate of grass you want to take home. <laughs> take a bottle of water home. You want it. There's some grapes in the room. Take a cracker But it was only the green. Only the green. So oh, not not the red or the, but yeah. Oh, here's the part with the, 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 the thinking math oh, on this. Yeah, is how, you know, if you've seen some of the fives yeah. out there, yeah. how do you measure that area to subtract it from the whole? Yeah, yeah, right. Huh. They, wow. They must have taken a square inch. Or yeah, but then they had to subtract foot. it. Yeah. 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 Much yeah. more clever than that, yeah. actually. Google Maps? Huh? Google Maps? Google Maps. They actually did use Google Maps to uh, one part of it to get some of that. No, they they had they said they had an aha moment in in uh, chemistry mm -hmm. because they thought, well, wait a minute, how are we going to do this? But they realized that they could get, you know, if you're trying to get uh, the area of something, they could get it going the root of density. Mm. So they put tin foil. On the on each one of those um, big letter or big numbers, crumpled it up. Oh, oh okay. Right, yeah. very crumpled it up so they could weigh it to get the density because they knew the density of tin foil and and so they used they went in the root of density yeah. in order to to mathematically find the two of the dimensions in volume and they could measure yeah. the height, and so that's how they found it. It was. They had a lot of interesting methodologies in terms of how to subtract things out. So, you know, kudos to them, they could think it. But this is, the, one of the things that was a big change this year is they've gone to electronic. I, I went into the math fair going, where are the, ma where are the boards? <laughs> <laughs> there were some, there were, but only about a quarter of them, because uh, they're, they're moving toward trying to create a website of these. But one of the issues is parent permissions. I, I'd show you the video, but I don't have the parent permissions yeah. on the students. But anyway, it was it was terrific, and I, and I got, we should probably make sure you hear about it next year because yeah. it's really interesting to come and what, see the work they're doing. <coughs> yeah. High school. Nine through twelve. Well, no, nine through eleven. So the, the seniors. They were, they were all involved in it. If you're an if you're in an honors class, it's required mm. to do it. Mm. I have a project for them. It's a project. Mm -hmm. I have a project. Uh, <laughs> Cubic foot of Jello. 
What? <laughs> Find out what it took for the Jello wings. Oh. Well, there's a thought that that one probably wouldn't stump some of these yeah, kids. Yeah, They're pretty sense. good. They're pretty good. So there are a lot of projects, and we'll try to get them up so people can see that. Now, the last thing is, and this was um, a request about lead. Um, I just received this this afternoon, uh, a memo from Christine Bongiorno, who is our Director of Health and Human Services, about the lead testing that's gone on here at Arlington, at, at all of our schools. Mm -hmm. So the water, and you have a copy of this report. And I've asked her whether I can Where? send it. Where? No, we didn't. Where? No, we didn't. No, we didn't. <laughs> I don't think so. No, Package? we didn't. Didn't make it. Didn't make it. It's did. certainly not in Novus. Not in Novus. Not definite, huh? Yeah, definitely not. <laughs> Maybe I know you had it in your hand. I know you had it in your hand. You had it in your hand. Double check. All right. Okay. Anyway. All right, well, we'll send it out to you. But okay. um, the, the EPA sets 15 UGs per liter as the standard mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, of lead. And so we have a summary of the most recent lead testing results. And all, uh, and this is one source at every school, and all of them were below that except for there was a faucet in a custodial closet at the high school that was at 15.4. And Ms. Bongiorno says that we believe the sample was not collected in accordance with MWRA collection standards, <clears throat> resulting in a slightly elevated result. So the most recent um, shows no evidence. In part, she said we have uh, newer piping too. Here? <laughs> when was the testing done? When was this testing done? This is. Hmm. Um, this is the most recent, and I think it's within, they do it every year. She said that. They do this testing, every, the lead testing every year? Each year, the Arlington Water Department collects two samples at two schools and two daycare centers. In addition to the routine testing that occurs, um, and that's so it's an annual, but we also have applied right. to the Massachusetts Departmental of Environmental Protection for that grant that was offered. Mm -hmm. it, I've heard anywhere from several weeks to several months before we know if we get the grant. But just yesterday, um, our director of facilities found out from the MWRA that they're sending us bottles that we can fill from all of the different sites. And it's very possible we'll get the results back before the end of the school year. So. If we get this grant, do we do additional round of testing? Yes. Or just, okay, yes. so there's but other testing we might be doing. There's more to it than just the testing. There's, um, if they get the grant, she explained here, um, what did she say? There's other things that we will be able to do with this money as well. No, they don't yeah. test it every year. No. Hmm. What? It's, they don't test it every year. Some of these schools hadn't been tested since 2008. Yeah, yeah, two th yeah, yeah, right. They sample them. They sample them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But these were the lead results then. So, so I, we're going to do, we're doing the, M, the MWRA testing, testing. now. Oh, everywhere. so this we'll is not, everything. these are not recent results. So we'll no. test everything. These are results from like yeah. 2008 or nine. <coughs> yeah, there's some samples. Well, but, so it's not clear when they do, they do the routine testing, they're sampling, if they're hitting every school every year. Yeah. But. I can find more information if you have questions for the for Ms. Bongiorno. If you could send the questions to Karen, we can get those answered. I just want to yes. clarify the testing you're talking about for MWRA. We're going to test all the schools. Yes, all the, the fountains and everything. So, That's my understanding. Good. good, thank you. That's. But I'm getting a second hand, so I'll have to clarify that. Okay. Well, I, but I'm pretty sure I, we're getting that. I had asked for this to be brought up, not because I had grave suspicions about any of our schools, but because of the amount that it's been in the news and the yeah. fact that other people have had, I, I think it's time and, and I wanted us to talk about it here so that our audience can hear it because I think it's coming to some of their minds. Um, yes. So mm -hmm. I'm glad it sounds like we're going to be able to test all the drinking fountains in all the schools. 
I don't know if we're going to test every single drinking fountain, but I think we're going to test. I, I, I shouldn't even say what we're going to test. Okay. All I know is we're getting bottles from MWRA, okay. and we're going to fill them and send them back for testing. Okay. The other thing that uh, Ms. Bongiorno pointed out to me the other day, there was an article out there about lead in Arlington water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you see that? Yep. Yeah. That is not an Arlington Public School. That is a nursery school program, I think, up on Arlington Heights. Um, but it is not, was not. And of course, you just read the, the headlines, you would assume this is an Arlington Public School, and it was not. So actually, just one, clarification. So if we do not get the grant, would we still do the testing that we're talking about? Or would, is it dependent on the grant? No, these are two separate things. Okay, so <coughs> the grant. Right, to do the full lead testing. Yeah, I don't yeah. know what the extent of the full lead testing will be. But one of the things we all want to know is, is the water that's com being consumed in our school buildings right. have lead in it. Right. Now, are we going to test every single water fountain? Probably not. But I think that you'll get enough samples that you should be able to say whether the piping, because the piping is coming in, you know, in the building and dispersing in various areas. How many sites will, as best practice to test, I, I couldn't tell you. So there's that grant that's sitting out there. Yeah. We were prepared to do the testing anyway okay. so if we, we didn't it. get it. Okay. But we applied for it because it was, it's, it's actually a fairly limited amount of money for the state for all, this, all the schools in the state. But, but then this new piece of information just came to our attention yesterday that, um, in fact, this afternoon, because uh, we had to clarify that the MWRA is going to do some testing. Mm -hmm. They're probably doing that for all of the customers uh, in the Boston area. So those bottles are arriving. Those bottles will be sent back, and I'm, we may have results before the end of the school year. Great. I'll Thanks. let you know. Yes, Ms. Turks. Um, so they're going to test every school That's with my those? That's Okay, because these are not the results of testing. This is just, these are results of testing over the years. Yeah. But yeah. what concerns me is that there's no testing that was done in 2014 or 2015. Right. If it says that we test two samples at two schools every year, where are the 14 and 15 results? That is a question that we can, we can ask. I don't know the answer. I just okay. literally got this late this okay. afternoon. All right. Yeah. And, and when they tested Thompson, I hope Thompson passed real well because it was just open that day. Well, Almost. they last the time they tested it was 2013. Right, they just opened it up. Right. <laughs> 2013 is right. No, it's got some of the oh, highest. The, some of it is coming in from outside. <laughs> it may not be. It's well, it's the piping in the, the street, The piping too. in the street, yeah. Could, they, yeah. Well, that also could be the joints. Yeah. You don't want okay. wet period in the, near the kids. No. 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 Okay. So anything, you. anything else? No, great. That's it. And did so we're no longer ahead of schedule. Sorry. Well, at least now we're, we're at on schedule. schedule. <laughs> we're at schedule. Okay. Um, so uh, the um, school committee wraps uh, on the building committee. Um, I think I understand. Uh, uh, you know, we hope to get a positive vote um, this Tuesday um, for the um, high school um, building project. But we thought we should go ahead and. Um, appoint the uh, two reps in the school, uh, reps in the school committee. And I have received sort of two people who are interested in doing it, um, Dr. Allison Ampey and Mr. Thielman. And I thought since this is such a big project that it'd be great to have more than one rep to have two people because um, two people can share the burden of the meetings and the notes and, 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 and it just may not be the case. It, it, it just may be too big of a job for one person to do. Um, so I, like to entertain do you, you have a I'm just comment gonna, are you uh, talking two for each project or one for the two no, people the that school. are volunteer? two for the uh, yeah I mean uh, the question uh, two people for the high school building project yeah um, it's just too big for so, me Bill, but not so too big for big. Kersey, so. no <laughs> um, so I guess entertain a motion to so move second perfect. okay so motion by uh, Mr. Sleefman seconded by Mr. Hayner all those in favor aye aye, aye. aye. and uh Nice. Good. Thanks. Congratulations. Do you know any more about the rest of the makeup of the committee? Sure. Dr. Brody, do we have any more information as of yet? Um, no. Um, there is going to be um, an offer made out to the community, but that won't happen until after 
after the, the election. I think we have 60 days, is that right? Yes. From this committee, mm -hmm. so, yeah. There are people who are, have already sent emails, and so there, we have, we're going to work on, and have started to work on criteria. Because it's not gonna be a big committee. We're, we're looking at probably just a couple community members. And I think that there will be an emphasis on experience and professional work that might lend lend some value, not value, but some expertise to this committee, which I think would be important to have. So that is that the the both the way to outreach and what we're expecting people to return to us has not been finalized. Dr. Allison Abbey. Who's making, I understand it hasn't been finalized, but who's, who's gonna make the decision? Right. Um, the town manager and, and myself. Okay. And actually, no one who has sent me an email is anyone that I know, so it's just gonna be strictly on, and it's gonna be hard, because we have quite a few people, and I know a lot of people would want to, but the one thing about it is, it's such a long project that the chances of people being able to stay the whole duration of it is gonna be challenging. But we're hoping that, I think there's a value having a little bit larger so that there's a, there's a, a institutional knowledge there too. Can I make one suggestion? Sure. If we have to have any meetings of the committee with the MSBA in Arlington, can we hold them at the Thompson School while the construction's going on? <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> That's a very good idea. I like that. <laughs> the only place available. That's nice, yeah. Well. At the end of the building. <laughs> Our newest school. I, I, think that, I think that the meetings are going to be in, in an MSBA. Mm -hmm. um, that's, they, that's usually how they have been. They're going to want to come on at least once or twice. You, you, you can hold them in the pit downstairs, no. the wrestling pit. No, I don't want them to catch anything. Anyway. Bugs. <laughs> They've been very, they were very good about coming out and bringing, sending a team in the fall, so they have a pretty good idea. They know what the high school looks like. Yeah, they, they, yeah. They, they brought out a really strong team of people, <laughs> and they toured, and they asked questions, so they have a very good idea what's, what we're dealing with here. Okay, um, consent agenda, a um, couple of things in here. Um, all items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There'll be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant, warrant 16175, dated May 26, 2016, in the amount of $655,668.04. As amended, <coughs> approval of minutes, minutes from the regular school committee meeting, May uh, 26, 2016. Approval of calendar, second reading of the 2016-2017 APS school calendar. Approval of job description, health office secretary. Approval of trip, um, approval of Montreal trip in April of 2017. Like Mr. Trip, Hainer. Trip pulled out. Pull out the trip, anyone else? Didn't we already adapt the calendar? Uh, no, this is the second read, so this would be the, the final. And didn't we just action. vote to could change it? Could I just say? We as talked about it. As amended today? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So um, can we do that easily? Mm -hmm. To the. Eight, yeah. oh, no, no. This is, this is actually, we haven't. This, this um, second reading includes the small change that was suggested oh, by Dr. Janger. You. So if we yep. approve this, I think it's, it goes through. So, so moved. Yeah. Okay, so um, moved by Mr. Thielman, seconded Second. by Ms. Starks. Um, okay, so we're pulling that, any discussion? We have no discussion, we're done, okay. <laughs> all in favor? Aye. 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 And uh, all opposed, okay, uh, unanimous uh, trip. On the yes, trip. on the trip, um, Mr. Hainer. This trip, I, it, it, since we we're approving it, it's a school uh, function. Am I correct? Um, yes, Dr. Bodie. It, the, the My concern is that when you th look through the document uh, on the first, first, I think it's the second page, sure. is there a process in place for students who cannot pay for the trip? It, I don't think it's, it's very, a school thing. Pardon me? Is this, uh, this is not a school thing, right? There's then we shouldn't be approving it. 
Can't be both. We've discussed this before, right? I mean, that we, this is not an official school sponsored trippers. Is that right? I have to put uh, it, It's materials. got signatures at the bottom of this from the principal to uh, the foreign liaison coordinator. Is it a French club trip? Is it? Yes. Yeah. From the middle school. We got What's the middle school French club. Superintendent's. Well, it says superintendent signatures, principal signature, signature department head, and signature of the international coordinator. And all those people signed on it. So, all I'm saying is, if this is a school-sponsored trip, I have issues with this. If it's not a school-sponsored trip, we shouldn't even be, it shouldn't even be brought before us. So actually, can I call, Dr. Allison Abbey, do you remember, we've discussed this in great detail. Do you remember sort of what the distinction was and whether? No. No, okay. <laughs> I don't either, no, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, it's, it's our teachers yeah. taking students from our school. Yeah, school right. trip. so that's what we it's have to do. We, we, we have trips like that. We have trips to Quebec. We have trips to Italy. We. I, I, I want to know. I'm not opposed <coughs> to this trip. I'm just concerned with students who cannot afford this. The, the, the way this was put, it, they suggest offers a donation page for students who wish to solicit donations for their own trip. And then... Uh, the I will research, I, I assume, I, I don't know who the I is. Is that the head of the department? No. Other means of fundraising, such as donors choose. And I, my understanding, we, when the school sponsors something, those students that we can identify, and we have a process for doing this, of need, the school picks up the bill. We don't have kids, the students going out and soliciting. If it is a private trip, that's appropriate. Kids do car washes and things of that nature. They've done that to, to go on different uh, sports uh, trips and things of this nature. Yeah, I mean, this, uh, Mr. Harden, yeah. That, this has come up with science camp, and there's yeah. there's no such policy. Yeah. No. What? There, that so the school covers the We trips. don't. We don't the cover PCOs, The school cannot offer a program that well, costs any money uh, that uh, requires a student to pay for. We, we this, do it all. This is, yeah, we do it all the time, and this is certainly um, something that we've been doing. I'm not suggesting well, what we're doing yeah, is, is yeah, following yeah. It's, it's, it's an offer. It doesn't mean that we would necessarily allow it. It's, but it is, it is something that the company is offering as a possibility for students if they want to do and that. So just a clarification, I, you, don't have to, you don't have to take this trip as a student, right? I mean, you're not going to be penalized no, in any way in terms to, of your... All I'm saying is this is something being offered through the school district. Yes. If you put something onus on a student, an added burden on a student, it is inappropriate because we are a public school fun thing. If this is a pri if we were in a private school or the private sector, no issue. If this is a private program that people want to have kids go on on their own, no problem. You no, know, I think we shouldn't well, be let's, approving let's, it. Let's actually bring this back to policies. Does that make sense? And for maybe further discussion, I know this is going been, on. Well, um, yeah, Mr. Thelen. So These, we, Oh, when do, when does the trip need to be approved? I mean, they need to start planning this, right? And so, this is our last meeting. So, yeah, well, I, I, I didn't mean the trip actually. I think I think this is a larger question that maybe so we should talk about. I think um, I think our I think I don't know if it's a rule. I don't know what it is, but um, <clears throat> when this has come up in the past, if it's mand mandatory and curriculum related, right. um, and a student can't afford to go on something that's part of a curriculum then we have to we have to take care of that but this is not this is an option it's, it's an offering to students then, then my question mm -hmm. goes so it's an offering it's an option if, for students then why so, are we involved well because there's there our teachers and our students are going to go on the trip right. and our then, insurance so is covering anything and that and might happen if, if once we become an agent i think our liability extends across so, the board I, okay we our liability does our insurance well liability. the liability also goes into the policy aspect of it okay mr schlickman okay um we've got students going to japan yeah we have everything they are not go we didn't they didn't come through us uh this is being handled through the community education exactly. so that uh if that's the way we're doing business with this uh and this is a community education offering rather than a school department offering Community education can offer a trip anytime they want and charge whatever they want for it and run it through that program. So thus it wouldn't come before us and we wouldn't need to approve it. 
What we need to approve in terms of, and we don't do out-of-state trips, well, what we're doing now is uh, more than X number of miles, so we're not approving trips to uh, Nashua. Um, you know, it's field trips organized during the day, all the kids get on the bus, they go someplace. Uh, if this is indeed a private o offering as it appears, I think the appropriate venue for that should be through the community education program and not through us, so we wouldn't vote it. Okay, Dr. Alessandri? I think we should separate this trip from what we want to do in the future. Yeah, I agree, yeah. Um, I would, okay, I think we should move approval of this trip um, because I don't want to not approve it and then have something right. fall apart. Right. And then I think policy should, I mean, when I say fall apart, I mean that, that the trip would have problems going forward, not no. that there's problems with the trip. Um, and then I think policy needs to clarify what we need to be doing and I think Mr. Schlickman's idea of having things go through committee ed might be a reasonable approach but I think we shouldn't yeah, be trying to that's a it too. Mr. If Rainer. we're going to do that we have to suspend filed uh, policy JJA which states all students which include late which include late night or overnight travel must have prior approval of the school committee which we're seeking right now Initial approval of the school committee is required before engaging students in fundraising activities. School committee will also consider educational value. Goes on. So, th so this is this is consistent then with the with, with that the policy. Yeah. With yeah. the policy. Okay. Um, so it sounds like a motion has been made by Dr. Alessandri to no. no? I will Sorry. make. I will make it. Yeah. I didn't. Okay. Yes. Well, let's I make approval. <laughs> What's the motion? I move approval of the trip. Move approval um, and with sort of the understanding that we're going to send this to policies in the future to look at the bigger picture that's, in the future that later, but this separate. is the trip. Seconded by Mr. Thielman. Um, okay, so all those in favor? Aye. 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 And I'm aye. Opposed? Aye. No. no. Okay, so two opposed. So then um, I think a second motion should be to move to direct yes. the policies and procedures subcommittee to um, evaluate we, we all do this issue. Okay, so um, motion by Mr. Thielman trips. to direct Second. the Policy and Procedures Subcommittee, seconded by Dr. Alessandri, uh, to look at the, um, do you get that? To, to, look get at, to look at the policy for- Field trips. For future trips. Well, all trips. For future trips. trips, yeah. Okay. Call the vote. Call the vote. Oh, we just did, didn't we? Oh, oh, this one. I I'm did. sorry, I'm so sorry. It's all right. <laughs> all those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, um, opposed? Okay, I think that's unanimous, thanks. Okay, um, so then subcommittee and liaison reports. Wait, did you vote on the rest of the, did you vote on the case? Yes, we did. We did, we did. Yeah, we did. Just did. yes. Yeah. I got confused. We're not sending you anywhere. Yeah, I think, I think we're, yeah. Subcommittee and liaison reports, um, budget. Okay. Um, this afternoon, okay, so budget hasn't met since we last met. Um, and has nothing to report in that respect. However, I realized that at this time last year, we were having some discussions over what kind of information we wanted to see in next year's budget book and how we wanted that to take shape. And um, I'm not sure of the timing. We can, I can meet with budget sometime before the end of school and we can start having these discussions. I haven't even had a chance to find out what the timing is of, of when the school department would need to know if, if we want to do. I felt that the information that we presented this year at town meeting was very well received, mm -hmm. especially the information about the things that we were not able to fund. I understand that it was a lot of work for the school department to put together. Um, I don't know if there's middle ground in there, but I think we need to have a conversation. Um, and my concern is that if this is our last meeting, this is, was kind of the last chance to do it right. um, before the, whenever we next meet. Um, but whether we want to try and do that again or whether we want to drop back to what we've been doing in the past. Um, Ms. Johnson, do you have anything to say about timing of these conversations? Um, I think if we, you know, it was the first time through doing something like that last year. I think we could figure out a way to make it a little less arduous. Okay. Um, 
it does change the timing of the submissions. And one of the things that I've always been very concerned about is that the town side does their budgets very early. Mm -hmm. They submit yeah. them right. basically in the fall with no information about the current year. So they're always two years behind. Mm -hmm. And this process that we went through in order to do it without going insane between November and December like we did last year, mm -hmm. we would also have to start it in September, October, which means we would have no information about the current year. Mm -hmm. So that's the downside. You know, I, I've always wanted us to be submitting a budget after Christmas because then at least we have the fall. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I know the town would very much like to push us back onto the same schedule, but I don't think that's advantageous for the schools. So, um, if this level of detail is needed, it's going to make a really tough November, December. Um, you know, but if that's what we need to do, I can clear the decks in the fall and figure that out. But, but I think his question is, do you, um, is it valuable to have a meeting now? Is that what you're asking? Well, part, part of what I'm asking is more to the committee mm -hmm. that what's the sense of the committee? Do we want to go this route again or do we want to kind of go back to the looser offerings that we did in yeah. the past? And let me just say the reason that I think that I'm kind of pushing for this and, and suggesting it is that I think over the next few years, we need to be building the case for what our budget needs to be. And this is, to me, is one of the foundations of doing that. And we need to be doing this year after year after year. I don't anticipate we're going to be able to do another Hail Mary pass and try and get more money from the town this year. I think the finances are getting tighter and tighter, and I understand that. But at the same time, at some point in the future, there is going to be a reequilibration potentially of what's needed. And I want us to have the best possible documentation and data from many years mm -hmm. showing what we need, you know, what we were hoping for, what we need. And, and, but I kind of want to know, are you guys all in with me or not? Mr. Hainer. I support, I think the benefits that came out of the town meeting uh, reflect uh, the work and uh, I'll support Diane in any way to help to make it less arduous than it was and I, I, I think she she put it we did it once it should be a little bit better each year going forward so I support it great uh, I can just tell you I know that certain people are very upset about it and other people were appreciative so <laughs> um, that may be that's what we have to encounter you know that's that's our deal yeah yeah anyone else okay. so just just to address that, yeah. I mean, there's a sense in town that greater transparency is the way to go, Absolutely. and I feel that this is creating greater transparency. What I would suggest then is that we will just, if, if this is the sense of the committee, then we'll have budget meet sometime with um, Ms. Johnson and, and the administration and just talk about, mm -hmm. you know, what are the possible shapes and timings and, and nail something down, and then we'll bring it back to the committee whenever we meet next. Okay. Yes. Yeah, and I was going to say that, that, that you just stole my words. So we, we can work on a way to try to lighten the load. I mean, we, you did all those multi-year analyses to support the funding request that we had for the Long Range Planning Committee that doesn't sound like we're going to need, so maybe that will lighten things up, and we can work with you to see a way to streamline it a little bit more. Great. The real work is is really really working with all the administrators who are making the submissions and going back and forth and back and forth. Well, how do you need it? How do you, how many do you need? When do you need it? And, and the depth that we went into in those descriptions. The narrative, not the numbers. Laura, Is that right? Is that, Julie mm -hmm. Dunn, myself, we were sweat and blood. Yeah. I mean, it was huge. And that part, there's nothing you can do to help with. Nothing. So, you know, it's, it's just understand that you're asking for a monumental amount of work. And, you know, if you feel it's very valuable, fine, but recognize that it is monumental. Okay. okay. Yes, that is. To me, it's likely to be worth millions of dollars in the future. From your mouth to God's ear. <laughs> well, okay. I mean, the, one, the one thing to keep in mind is that there's, there's a couple of major votes coming up, and the town meeting is the first time that you kind of present yeah. evidence of what's coming. And mm -hmm. so we have, hopefully, if uh, we're successful on the 14th, we have a high school vote that's going to be substantial. And then after that, we have a, a possible override that could be large. And so, you know, I think with the, I think it's this should be resolved in a subcommittee meeting with everybody in the room that's going to be doing the work. Mm -hmm. um, but we got to keep in mind that 
there's a lot of big things coming up. Yep. And it should be resolved by, I think, the subcommittee yeah. meeting with you guys and figuring it out. Okay. <clears throat> that good? Yeah, I'm, I'm just, are you saying we shouldn't provide so much information or? or no, he's saying, he's saying we are not going to resolve. No, I'm not sure. Everything. No, exactly. yeah, I'm saying that whatever we provide should be done with that in mind. That, that we have, yeah. that, so whatever we, we provide should be done with the idea of voter education in mind. Town meeting member education and then voter education. Got to keep that in, in, the, in, in the forefront. So, but that's really a subcommittee discussion, but that's how I view it. Mm -hmm. That's how, that's the context for me. We have to educate people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, community relations. Ms. All right. Um, community relations. Um, everybody has a copy of our draft minutes from our meeting on May 31st in Novus. Um, we looked at the dashboard, which you saw today, um, and we talked about, you know, things uh, that we still wanted to make changes to there. Um, we also talked about the parent and teacher survey about calendar issues. Um, and I think that. Uh, from that, so there were a lot of questions in there about start of the school year, dealing with too many snow days, um, but uh, looking at the data in our discussions in that meeting, um, the only recommendation we came up with is that we thought we really wanted to investigate the later start time at the middle and high school um, by reopening, the, and part of the reason for that is you'll understand in a minute is the timing. Um, because we have to reopen negotiations with the teachers union in order to do that. Um, and so we, and we felt that if we were gonna change the starting time that we wanted to make a decision at least a year before it went into effect. So our thought was to have kind of, if in the 16, 17 year we negotiate and we investigate and we talk about it, um, we have a plan and we can get it out in the 17-18 school year and then we would implement it in the 18-19 school year, which basically follows along with, I think, what the superintendent's group is doing as far as um, their recommendations. Um, and so we just wanted to make sure that the committee was in agreement with those ideas. And if so, I don't know if we need a motion or not, but... Um, then we would kind of start in the fall. And so um, the motion is to reopen the negotiations, is that? I think that we probably need a motion we for that, motion? yeah. So we would need a motion to reopen negotiations in the next school year in our next, when we come back um, to start discussion about right. school year time, start times. I, I, think, I think you've made that motion seconded you, by Mr. Hainer. Do you want it now? Yeah. No. Charles seconded. Okay. Um, discussion about that motion. Yes, Dr. Alcinapi. Can I ask, so if I'm figuring this out right, it would be kind of at the same time as we would be op reopening the Gibbs? Right. Yes, right. exactly. Okay. So it, not, not only that, it comes at a very good time then. That, right? That's what I'm, I think that's yep. a... And I think there was a question about what sixth grade would look like. Would it have the, what, when would it start? There's, there was an open question about that. Right, right. but it, it also may make some differences for bus availability. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Uh, comments, Ms. Hanson, do you want to? Yeah. I guess I would just add, I, I really think it's a good idea to open the conversation on it because we talk, the more we talked about it, the more complex it, yeah. it seemed and it just seems that, like there's a lot to investigate and think about and explore, so that'll give us the time to do that. And I went to a um, evening presentation at Newton North that talked about later start times as being, um, I mean, the claim was made that this was one of the most valuable things a school district could do in terms of for social emotional reasons and for academic achievement. And so I, I'm going to summarize and provide links to the uh, research that was presented to me that night to, to help with this. Yeah, Dr. Allison, but, but again, aren't, when they talk later start times, we're already late or late-ish compared yeah, yeah. to yeah. We're not, we're not so in as bad shape not, as some of these you know, so places, we're, absolutely. We can't necessarily expect to see this We're not same. making a massive change. Yeah. Well, there was we're claims that even to 8.30 would make a big difference, but yeah. yeah, you're right, it's not the same thing as moving from 7 to, right. <laughs> absolutely, right. right. And we yes. want to do this in conjunction with, you know, the, the superintendent's group is also doing this and looking at it as a group of schools, um, you know, and the sports, people are yes. you know weighing in so it's all good I feel like and this is their same time frame as well I believe that they're looking at the 1819 mm -hmm. calendar year for, I mean school year for right. Mr. Slipin I, I think I 
answered my own question. <laughs> I was puzzled by something, but I figured it out. Oh, okay. So I also, we have these survey results from um, AEA and uh, from the community, and I actually reformatted mine to look like yours, mm -hmm. just to make it easier to read. Um, do you want to just say a couple things about what you Wait, found? Can we vote? Oh, I'm sorry. We, we didn't vote that. I'm, <laughs> I'm terrible at this. Sorry. <laughs> I deeply apologize. Okay. <laughs> All those in favor of the motion to reopen negotiations with AEA next year, please say five. Say Aye. yes. Aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Okay, that's unanimous. Thanks. Okay, uh, Ms. Hansen, do you want to say? couple of minutes a few um, things even less than a minute without yeah. having it in front of me um, I don't so I think in general there was definitely um, a real appetite to consider starting um, before Labor Day um, with the idea of the two teacher days two student days and then the long weekend um, over Labor Day weekend but when you and I had actually sat down and kind of looked ahead at when the Labor Day was, when Labor Day is over the next couple of years we realized it's really we're in a good cycle again for a couple of years and so um, oh, here it is, thank you. So, and, and just thinking about all the other changes that are going on, that it makes sense to kind of, kind of sit on this good, inf you know, good information that we collected from both the teachers and the community and think about that and think about um, the 17, 18 year, the beginning of the negotiation for the next contract, that that might be a good time to consider that. Um, Overall, though, there was really not a lot of interest in merging February and April vacation. Um, the elementary release day, people are really satisfied with the Tuesday. Um, that works for people. And, you know, overall, a slight majority um, interested in moving to the 8.30 time start um, if, the, if all the Middlesex schools do the same. So um, I think we have some good information to work with. Yeah. And I could just say about the parent survey, um, and I think this is true about AEA too, there wasn't a deep dissatisfaction with the current schedule. So there was, there was a willingness to consider a change in several cases, but there wasn't, people weren't clamoring for it necessarily, so we should take that under consideration. Um, the difference between parents and teachers were that um, they were less excited about the particular model of starting, of, of having school on Wednesday and Thursday um, before Labor Day, and they were more excited about moving to the 8:30 time. Um, that 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 was actually their strongest. If, if all if Middlesex, if all Middlesex schools do the same, 62% um, um, felt very strongly, and 17% were neutral. So really, very small opposition for that one from parents. And that was that was the only real difference. I think those were the differences with parents and, and teachers. What I saw. Yeah. Uh, maybe just one slight I think not everybody was necessarily clear that everybody would be going to 8.30 mm -hmm. or everybody would going, be going to that window between 8 and 8.30. So right. that's, that's just a slight okay. nuance for people to think about. Okay. Mr. Hainer. That 8.30 start, we're talking secondary school, am I correct? Middle and high school. If that's the time yes. chosen. Yes. Yes, that yes. was it. The that was it. Yes. yes. So that will have a ripple effect on the middle school and the, and the elementary school, am I correct? It's middle school, middle school would be too. Affected. And then, yeah, middle school and, middle school and, and, high, school and high school, is, I think, is a question. But the elementary won't be? No, the elementary. And then open question uh -huh. about sixth grade. They already start later. Yeah. They yeah. start around. They start they, they would be starting. What time do they start right now? 8.10. Yeah, 8.10. So they would, the elementary would be starting earlier than the high school if we move to that kind of a model. Yeah. Yes. Right. Uh -huh. right. Well, right. good luck with that one. <laughs> yes, Mr. Slickman. In the report, uh, uh, on the parent caregiver survey, I just want to state uh, sort of a, a beef with the language. Okay. Uh, in that it, it's written, however, in comments, parents are strongly in favor of merging the February and April vacation. Yeah. It was mentioned by parents 64 times. Yeah. Well, that that's four point four percent of the people responding <laughs> wrote that in. Oh, Prob I, yeah. Probably after they... Uh, made the, the response survey. and the merge February vacations was unpopular yep. by 50%. So I wouldn't say that's a strongly Got it. favor. Uh, I do mention the, it, yeah. it was the most comments, but I think that the, there's no strongly Got it. favor there. Got it. You're right. You're right. Yeah. That was poor language on my part. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, so the next, uh, we are now at uh, CIAA. 
Uh, CIAA, you've basically dealt with what district we did uh, early with the district goals. Excellent. Um, facilities. Vote on June 14th. Yes. <laughs> vote. Get out. Vote. That's vote. the report. My daughter voted today. Excellent. Yay. Excellent. Yes, you can yes. vote. You can vote now. Yep. You can go Absentee to the town ballot. hall and Just vote Just remember, right tomorrow now. they close at noon. Yes, two, that's two right. Five. Yes. And Monday, the, it stops at noon as well. Yes, the day before the and vote, the it always Oh, you stops can't vote after again. noon absentee. You only okay, have Friday, good information. Thank you. Thank you. If you're going to absentee ballot. Yes. Uh, policies and procedures, Mr. Uh, Hayner. We met. Uh, we are, we did not, we have nothing to bring forward tonight. We will continue uh, to look into the uh, homework policy and handbooks to see the compatibility or lack of. I am charged with getting job descriptions and uh, surveys on secretaries, school committee secretaries. The biggest time we spent was on school committee agenda, uh, talking about formatting and uh, topics. Uh, some of them were talking, this is still discussion, folks. Uh, talking about subcommittee of the whole, uh, set um, oh, right. informal discussions maybe at the beginning of a meeting mm -hmm. and set the second part for policies and stuff. Uh, different mm -hmm. retreats, possibly two or three during the year with specific agenda items uh, <coughs> in the beginning, maybe the superintendent. Um, first meeting in September, we'll pull all these together and the additional ones that we were given to us tonight and report back to the whole with recommendations. Great, great. Um, mm -hmm. So, did you, where am I at? Uh, weren't. Task force. School enrollment task force, yes. Do we have anything? Vote on Tuesday. Vote on Tuesday. <laughs> 14th. <laughs> yes, indeed. Please. <laughs> weren't vote committee. On Tuesday. Vote on, no. Uh, all the, everyone got paid. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any school liaison reports? No? Uh, yes, Ms. Starks. I don't have a school liaison report, but yep. I did attend uh, the last meeting of both the Wellness Committee mm -hmm. and the Arlington Youth Health Safety Coalition. Um, the Wellness Committee was last week. Um, I attended their June meeting. That is like an awesome meeting. It's like all, you know, it's food, it's everything from food service to nursing yep. to adult education, summer programs, um, and uh, at the end, they did ask, you know, what they could do for us. And one thing I really wanted to understand, and I was kind of hoping they could put it together next year, would be a comprehensive. I would really love to understand K to 12 what our health curriculum mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. um, and what we teach and when we teach it. Um, okay. I know that it's piecemeal, and that you know some gets done by the Great Body Shop, and some gets done by here and there. And so I said, you know, if you could really lay that out for us. Um, I, for one, would be very interested in um, understanding that and understanding who teaches it. Okay, you know, so that's I know that a we're district, we don't have health yep. teachers, but you know, some PE teachers teach mm -hmm. health, some mm -hmm. nurses teach health, some you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. So um, I just wanted to better understand that. So hopefully they will be coming in or uh, can do that for us in the fall. Okay. Um, this afternoon, I attended the last of the Arlington Youth Health Safety Coalition meetings. Uh, for the year and it was mostly just a wrap-up of what they've done this year and thinking about things that they will be doing next year um, They've had a very successful year this year um, in and uh, We talked a little bit about the survey results. There will be a parent forum on the survey results not only from the um, Students, but also the parents kind mm -hmm. of what do parents think about kids and what they're doing and Kind of what our but students. We haven't seen those results. Yeah, and kind yeah. of yeah. like putting those together in an interesting. Do you know if they are available? Forum. Are they are both of those available? I know the students ones we've seen, but I we... don't know if they're okay. available yet. Um, but uh, so that was interesting. It was so they talked about some of their initiatives for next year and, mm -hmm. and kind of what they're up to. So great. Mm -hmm. And I just okay. realized that this should actually we should actually change this to liaison reports in the future. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. Not instead of school. All liaison, all liaison, all liaison reports. Liaison. Right. Yeah. To, just a yeah. Yeah, Mr. Hainer. I attended the uh, program for the, uh, special needs parents coming in from fifth grade to sixth grade at Audison last night. There were <coughs> over, close to 40 parents there. It uh, was well attended. The program was uh, the uh, assistant principal, principal, and uh, the spe special education director. Is that Coordinator. the term? Coordinator. Coordinator. Thank you. We're there. To answer questions, uh, talked about initially about the programs. They took them on a tour of the building and then came back and answered questions. Uh, I thought it was well done, uh, well received. Uh, there's, as all parents, uh, there's still anxiety. 
one of the things that was brought up about uh, having their students tour the building ahead of time before the first day of school, mm -hmm. there's some sort of program that's there, but it's been booked oh, yeah. real tight. So I'd, I'd, I'd ask you to, uh, if there's any way to broaden that. Uh, one or any way for, for them. Sped yeah. Maybe. Well, it, there, there is there is there is something already in place. Yes. But it's 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 it gets Probably it got it filled up. up. It, it yeah. fills up every year. Very, and it's not targeted quickly. to specialized. So the, yeah. potentially, it, if possible, yeah. to expand it enough to cover everybody. To, to hold. but it was very, it was a compliments to the staff mm -hmm. uh, that ran it and to the parents that were there. It was really well done. Uh, any other announcements? Yes, Mr. Real quick. Yes, go ahead. Um, I would like to, and I apologize, I don't have the student's name. I will get them to the superintendent to ask her to put it in her next newsletter. There were four people that came to the uh, veterans, uh, the memorial program that we had, a quartet. They were extraordinary. Uh, they were just, they were fantastic. Uh, yesterday at Rotary, uh, five students from here, sophomores, and I think there was one junior who had attended RILA, which is Rotary Youth Leadership Program for the weekend. Uh, I was just so impressed with their presence, and they came uh, before a group of old fuddy-duddies and uh, really presented themselves really well. Compliments to the staff and to their parents, and I will get their names to you, too. Uh, thank you. Other announcements? Uh, I think there's an election on Tuesday, June 14th. <laughs> <laughs> that everybody should I vote. I encourage yes. you to go <laughs> vote. Um, please. Please vote. Oh, wait, future Help agenda us. items that we might want to consider in the fall. We've heard some things tonight. Yes, Mr. Hainer. Uh, mentioned before, and I did the policy, the idea to uh, possibly a retreat or, or something just so that we're all on the same page uh, with the superintendent of right. the evaluation. Yeah, so, so actually what we talked about, and just to clarify, um, changing the way we do things a tiny bit to add a couple more retreats potentially and also potentially at the beginning of some meetings every once in a while when needed to have in a less formal discussion among the whole school committee. So hopefully those will help us do our job better. Thank yeah. you. Okay, um, we're gonna have to move this time, I think. <laughs> no, no. no, no. Not yet, not yet, I know. Um, we're going to executive session. Um, I have to read this first, right? You, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, and we will be returning from executive session um, on camera, that's yes. what I understand. Uh, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect to conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. <laughs> collective bargaining may also be conducted. Uh, we have a vote for the MOA for AEA Unit C, a vote for the MOA for AEA Unit A stipends, and a vote to approve the following executive session minutes. Thursday, April 30th, 2015, Thursday, May 14th, 2015, Thursday, May 28th, 2015, Thursday, June, 11th, 2015, Wednesday, June 24th, 2015, Thursday, October 22nd, 2015, Thursday, November 12th, 2015, Thursday, November 19th, 2015, Thursday, December 10th, 2015, Thursday, January 28th, 2016, Thursday, February 11th, 2016, Thursday, March 24th, 2016, Thursday, April 14th, 2016, Thursday, May 26th, 2016, are we done? Yes. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> and after I have to commend Karen for her amazing work on getting this together before we um, take the vote. Uh, so roll call, Mr. Carden? Yes. Dr. Alice yes. Mappy? Mr. Slipman? Yes. Yes. Ms. Darks? Mr. Yes. Hayner? Yes. Mr. Gilman, and I vote yes. Okay, so we're now in executive session. <laughs> okay. Okay, we're back from executive session. Um, we have two motions that we're gonna consider. So first I move that uh, we approve the memorandum of agreement between the Arlington School Committee and the Arlington Education Association Unit C. Second. Seconded by Mr. Hayner. Um, and this is a conditional approval. Um, they, um, no, I don't say that? Just okay, say sorry. <laughs> well, just to say they haven't yet voted on it. Okay, uh, all those in favor? Um, <laughs> we have to go down? No. No, no okay. No, not in so I okay. Uh, oppose. Okay. A unanimous vote. Second motion. And the second is uh, a uh, moved uh, to uh, that the school committee approves the um, 
renegotiated stipends um, with the Arlington Education Association. Second. Okay. Second by Mr. Hayner. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, opposed? No. No. Uh, so three opposed. Mr. So it's four to three. Yeah. Okay. Good. Motion, both motions carry. Um, motion, to motion to adjourn by Mr. Hayner. Second. Second by Ms. Starks. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, unanimous? Great. Good. Thank you. Uh, see you.